Welcome to r slash Am I the Jerk, where Karen demands to name OP's baby. Am I the jerk for not letting my mother-in-law name my child? I, 29 female, have been married to my husband, who's 31, for two years. We went to university together and worked at the same coffee shop. We instantly clicked and became best friends immediately, and after a while, we decided to date. The first time I met my mother-in-law, she wasn't very accepting of me and my personality. She, according to my husband, as he told me later, said, She's too loud and obnoxious. I can't believe you'd date someone like her. I was appalled, obviously, but decided to ignore it instead of confronting her for fear of her openly rejecting me and not approving of our relationship. I never mentioned this incident, and according to my husband, she hasn't said anything since. After my graduation, we decided to get married. My mother-in-law seemed to be upset about it and was helicopter parenting the whole time. I tried to ignore it, but it got on my nerves. She wanted to decide the color of the flowers, the dress style, the decor, and even the wedding meal. I couldn't take it anymore and I snapped at her. I reminded her that this was my and my husband's wedding, not hers. She was angry and I apologized for snapping at her. But to be honest, I was exhausted from all the wedding preparations with her backseat driving. Long story short, the wedding went well and while she gave me a few dirty looks, she didn't do anything. Last year, I got pregnant and had my baby on March 16th of this year. We didn't decide to name her until the last month of my pregnancy. My husband and I were thinking of names and landed on Andromeda. We thought it was gorgeous and because we both loved astronomy, it was the perfect name. My husband was especially excited about this name. He's always been a bit of a geek in the cutest way possible and when he thought of it, we immediately knew that this was the name for her. Mother-in-law, however, did not agree. She argued that she had wanted to continue the family tradition of the grandparents choosing the name. She said that she had been named by her grandmother and so had my husband. I, however, thought this was a load of BS. She wanted us to name the baby Mary after her and her grandmother. I thought that was selfish, but my husband seemed to be considering it. I explained to him that we shouldn't let his mother choose the name of our baby. We had already decided on the name Andromeda. At a recent family get-together, we brought little Andy to see everyone. Mother-in-law kept referring to her as Mary, and I tried to tell her to stop. I told her multiple times that our baby was our baby, and her name was Andromeda. I legitimately think she is either delusional or has a personality disorder. I don't know how to get her to stop. My husband is considering changing Andromeda's name to Mary just to get his mother to stop. I protested this, but it's still a sore subject in conversation. I don't know what to do. Am I the jerk, or should I listen to my husband and his mother about this? Here's how you get her to stop. You limit your contact with her until she complies. Let's be real with this. Your husband is the weak link. Get him on board, as he must be the lead in dealing with his own mother. The fact that you are the lead is another indication he is weak. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Your husband needs to step up and set some boundaries with his mother, or your marriage is in serious trouble. This is a hill to die on. Do not change the baby's name just to appease his mom. This will give her license to run your lives. You need to make sure your husband understands that. I'm sure mother-in-law is throwing every guilt-laden trope at him to get him to change his mind. He's done nothing wrong. His mother is being extremely unreasonable. I hope you work this out. Am I the jerk for refusing to cook for my family? So I, 16 male, still live with my family, obviously. I have chores just like my siblings, but something I do for fun and because I love and have a passion for it is cooking. I started cooking for myself three years ago. I had cooked before, but nothing like the last three years. I enjoy making my own breakfast and dinner and even lunch if I have no school. My parents saw I was cooking more and they added that to my list of chores because mom said they didn't want to waste food and dad said it was rude to cook for only one person. And I didn't mind cooking for everyone, but they were so ungrateful my siblings and parents alike. Complaints I got were, too spicy, wanted potatoes instead of rice, wanted rice instead of noodles, wanted beef instead of chicken, wanted something plain instead of spicy, blah blah blah. None of this was constructive either. It was whining and complaining, and I did start out asking what I should do, but everyone wanted something different, and I'm still in school. I can't spend six hours cooking dinner on a school night so my siblings can have pizza, fries, nuggets, tacos, and my parents can have steak and potatoes and gravy. I even made a weekly meal plan for a while and they wouldn't complain until after they ate it. 
I spoke to my family about the way they were behaving and my mom told me that's the reality of cooking for a family. She said my siblings and dad had always been like that with her and she just said that it's part of life. A few times my dad or one of my siblings would say I wasn't a very good cook and they hated eating my food. So I said I wouldn't cook anymore and dad and mom would get upset and my siblings called me lame. So I stopped cooking for them. I cook just for myself again and my parents are furious. They all come home hungry and I have nothing ready for them, not even my siblings. My parents told me that it's disrespectful and I can't continue and I said they were the disrespectful ones. They told me I shouldn't be okay with letting them go hungry and I said they all deserve to be hungry. My parents said it was a disgusting attitude and they grounded me for two weeks. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. It's your parents' responsibility to take care of you. Cooking is a wonderful interest to have and I hope your enjoyment is not ruined by your family's behavior. It's one thing to share your dishes alongside the rest of the food during meals, but another thing entirely to be responsible for feeding all of your family members. Am I the jerk for telling my husband his buddy is too comfortable in our home and that he needs to set boundaries? I'm 24 female and my husband who's 28 has a friend who comes over frequently and will often spend the night because he can't afford frequent Ubers and my husband does not feel comfortable driving after drinking and I'm currently too pregnant to drive. This friend honestly never came over much before but my husband got a job working two weeks on, two weeks off at a mining camp so I don't get much time with him hence prioritizing time with me, his pregnant wife, over nights out with friends. I didn't mind at first when he would come over, but it started to get uncomfortable quickly. After his first three to four visits, if I did not have a meal started or ready by the time he arrived, he would walk into my kitchen and start preparing a meal with our food. Of course, he would make enough for all of us, but I've genuinely never experienced that with a friend before and it weirded me out. My husband doesn't have a problem with it though, so I said nothing to that. This morphed into him bringing stuff to make us, which I did appreciate, but was still uncomfortable because if I offered to help or cook, he would tell me to go relax, as if I were the guest in my own home. What really irked me is last night he stayed over again, and my husband and I had slept in, although I had gone to the washroom a couple times because pregnancy. His friend, I guess, got bored and walked into our room without even knocking, asking if we wanted eggs. We both turned him down. So again, he just goes into the kitchen and helps himself to our food. I find it extremely weird and really don't like that he didn't knock. I've never acted like that at any of my friends' homes and have never been treated like that before. Of course, I would be fine having someone help themselves to any drinks or snacks, but going and making a full meal, and just for yourself since neither my husband nor I were hungry, it really weirded me out. I spoke to my husband about all of this and how I don't appreciate being treated as a guest in my own home almost as if I'm a bad host and especially not having my privacy intruded on. My husband agrees for the most part but also says his friend is just doing this stuff to be nice and he doesn't want to create conflict. I told him he needs to set some boundaries because I will not be made to feel uncomfortable in my own home. This upset my husband a bit and he's accusing me of not liking his friend and saying his buddy will think that I hate him. Am I the jerk for asking for some boundaries? Not the jerk. You need to establish what you consider acceptable and simply state that to your husband as what you want. For example, he may think it's nice, but I would like to have meal times on our schedule, not his, and I would appreciate it if you could make it clear to him that if he wants to prepare something, he needs to clear it ahead of time. I'm guessing from your narrative that you probably are a bit meek on the telling him what you want side, but a friend like this requires a firmer tone of voice and choice of language. I would like this, and I'm going to be unhappy if that. So, would you please do whatever? No jerks here. The buddy is trying to be helpful, cooking for you both while you're pregnant, taking care of his own needs when he's been invited to stay over, etc. He obviously has no idea it bothers you. Talk to your husband about what precise boundaries you want. Not coming into your bedroom is a good start. Limiting the days he comes, so you get more time alone with your husband, also sounds like a good one, and so on. Then, he needs to tell his friend and present it as from both of you, not a request from you alone. Am I the jerk for blowing up at a friend who is obsessed with my rich parents? I'm a first year engineering student. This doesn't take place in the US, so tuition for a four year degree is about 35K. I'm 18 female, and my friend, who's also 18 female, will call her Jane. She won't stop complaining about and telling everyone we meet that my parents are loaded. 
When she first came to my place, she would not stop making comments about how it must be so nice to have parents that pay for everything, so I can afford to live in such a nice apartment. The thing is, they don't pay for everything. My parents aren't even notably well off. My mom is a school teacher who works part-time, and my dad is an engineer in a field so bad, he somehow makes less than her right now. When I was born, my parents set up an education savings account for me and added to it very consistently. The agreement between me and my parents has always been that I will move out after high school, they will cover tuition, and I will be in charge of everything else. I understand that I'm very lucky that my parents cover tuition, but I still cover rent, utilities, Wi-Fi, food, and literally anything else I buy, all of which is considerably more expensive than annual tuition where I live. I was able to do this because I've worked since I was 15, had great summer jobs, and applied to no less than 40 scholarships in my senior year of high school. I explained this to Jane. She literally doesn't absorb any of it. When we go out for snacks, she'll try to get me to pay for her because my parents pay for everything and I have a lot of money. She'll constantly make comments about how easy my life is because I get an allowance from my parents. I don't, in front of other people, very loudly. When we go to study, she'll say, we should go to OP's. Her parents bought her this fancy apartment. They didn't. She tells me how nice it is that I didn't have to budget. I do. I'm on a tight budget, and it has very little wiggle room in order to be able to afford a place near campus. I've tried talking it out with her, and nothing changes. This all came to a head the other day when she told our friend group that I could drive us to the mall because my parents had bought me a car. My parents did not buy me a car. I don't even own a car. I have no clue why she would say this. I blew up at her and called her a jealous jerk. I said that if she can't conceptualize the fact that I pay for my own crap through my own hard work, maybe that says more about her than it does about me. She left quickly after that and it was super awkward. She was being a total jerk, but some of my friends are saying I took it too far and I should have been calmer and kinder. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She fully deserved this. Even if you were personally the richest person of all time, this is unacceptable behavior on her part. You didn't come close to taking it too far. These aren't your friends standing with her, they're her puppets. Cut them all out. Not the jerk. She sounds weird and a little unhinged and you shouldn't engage with her further. Seriously, do not let this girl in your home. She's jealous and delusional and could be an actual danger. I, 25 female, have face blindness. My boyfriend who's 24 likes to test me. How do I make it clear this is not okay? I've been with my boyfriend for almost a year now. I love him dearly and he loves me too, I'm guessing, but there's one thing that's causing a lot of issues for us. I suffer from face blindness, which means it's really hard for me to recognize people's faces. I usually go by other characteristics to put a name to a person, like hairstyle, facial hair, marks, skin colors, accessories, etc., but it's still really tough. It's caused me anxiety and other mental health struggles. I'm lucky to have wonderful people around me though, who are aware and try to help. They'll introduce themselves when we start talking, wear something they know I've linked to them or whatever. Usually my boyfriend does this too, but sometimes he likes to test me and it's incredibly stressful. He shaved off his beard once. A few times he wore a completely different style of clothing or changed his hairstyle, all without warning me. In those moments, he won't tell me who he is or say someone else's name, just to see if I'll figure out it's him. He'll make jokes saying he's trying to switch with one of his friends and see if I'll stay loyal. I usually do realize it's him, but it causes me a lot of anxiety. We've had big fights over this. He says he's allowed to change his look and that he's not a cartoon character. I ask him to warn me. Don't get me wrong, he cares about me, but I don't think he gets how stressful it is. How do I make it clear? We have a lot of great times together, there's just this bump. Update. I went to talk to him, showed him this, and told him he can't do it anymore. The conversation was a lot. First he was angry I made this post, then he was angry I was taking it all so serious. Lots of apologies and so on. He again said he was just trying to make a tough situation more light. I said it's too much. He said I can't take a joke and I need to let him be him. That he always tells me when he's been joking and if he was really keen on hurting me, he would just do things and not tell me. So him telling proves that he cares. At one point, he said he just wanted to test if it was real, because I could just be using it as an excuse to do anything. I left after that because we were going in circles. 
There was a lot of me making an issue of one small thing. I'm exhausted. He's still blowing up my phone with love and apologies, but you guys made me realize a lot. I'm trying to stay rational, but it's hard because I do care about him a lot. Update. A lot has happened in the last few days. I'm really grateful to all of you. I wasn't aware of the real meaning of his pranks and what it said about him and our relationship. I went to talk to him the same evening I made that post with the intention of making clear he can't pull all that anymore. The conversation escalated. We talked for hours into the night and every day since, there's been a lot of messages. He got angry about the Reddit post I made. I showed him. He was angry at you guys, angry that I couldn't take a joke and that I listened to strangers. Said things like, in the beginning, he didn't believe I actually suffered from it and would use it as an excuse to cheat on him. That now he does believe it, but due to bad breakups in the past, he has a hard time trusting I won't use it as an excuse regardless. Said he was joking about it because he wanted to make a tough situation lighter and that's just his sense of humor. That if I loved him, I'd accept that. When I made it clear I was done, it got even worse. He began apologizing a lot. Said he didn't realize it was such a big thing for me. Again, didn't make any sense with all said before. To be honest, I was done. I do care about him a lot, but it's never going to work. There's been many, many messages and calls. He dropped some vague hints that sometimes he pulls pranks I was unaware of. I don't know if that's true or he's just in a bad place right now. He also came to my place to apologize again, but I suspect he didn't expect I'd immediately recognize him as he didn't apologize until I said his name. He's not evil, he's just really messed up right now. I blocked him everywhere, told him not to show up anymore and that a friend would give him his stuff. I'm going to delete this account soon, but I wanted to thank you guys for helping me realize it. I genuinely don't think I would have. I'm heartbroken, but a bit relieved as well. Thanks for all the support. My fiance is threatening to end her relationship with me if I don't stand up to my parents. We've been together for three years and engaged for a couple of months. I'm going to call her Liz for this. I'll admit that I have let my parents get away with a lot of comments I should not have that have caused Liz a lot of unnecessary hurt, but they have a mostly good relationship. She says she feels that she has to mask who she is around them and has accepted that when we have kids, my family will hate her for being unwilling to push religion on them, which I have tried to tell her won't happen. We're planning our wedding now, mostly her. Recently, we had a discussion on location and I mentioned that I think a lot of churches are pretty and probably cheap. Liz vetoed it and went on to mention that she's unwilling to have a religious wedding and realized that my parents will probably be upset. She then said she thinks she would like to elope as her family is fully supportive. They've already watched her get married to her late husband and she wants the wedding to be for us and what we value, not about sending a fake image that will inevitably be broken anyway. I was hurt and told her she was being unfair to my family and that we would need to find a compromise. Liz told me that we either elope or I set boundaries with my family about what's acceptable to complain about. She brought up a conversation with my mom where she had gone to a funeral with no religious references and had talked about how wrong that was and how can you have any hope at all that they went to the right place otherwise, which Liz, as a widow, ended up privately crying about and I did defend my mom's right to have an opinion, which I kind of regret. I told her I love my parents and that they care about her despite what she thinks. I said even a small religious reference would be enough to appease them without compromising her values. Usually Liz goes out of her way to be kind and respectful to everyone, but she told me that maybe I should find a different bride if that's genuinely how I feel and went home. What can I say to her? I love this woman, but she's come into the relationship knowing my family is like this and that they will be devastated knowing I deconverted. She offered a compromise and you didn't like it. Your idea, church wedding. Hers, elope. Her compromise, non-religious wedding. You just want to appease your parents on you and your fiancé's wedding. Yeah, your fiancé has seen some red flags with your deference to your parents and knows that you're not ready to get married until you've sorted that out. Seems like you'll have to decide what you value more, your parents' feelings and approval or your relationship. I'd request the same thing if I were in her shoes. I see nothing wrong here. The fact that you're pushing back is a huge red flag for Liz and I hope she reevaluates whether she should be entering into a marriage with you. You love this woman and yet you let your mother hurt her and even defend your mother when she does. Your love is not enough. Entitled Aunt tries to use my parents to steal from me. 
Now, I honestly never thought that my parents would be stupid to be caught like this. They've never done anything like this to my other siblings, but hey, this incident happened because my aunt decided to lie and tried to steal from me. So a few years back, I moved out of the family home and bought my own home. Nice little place I could call my own and do my own crazy ideas that I couldn't really get away with. Naturally, I had given my parents a spare key just in case there was an emergency or I forgot to return something. Now, after a while of living on my own and saving a few quid here and there, I managed to get my gaming room slash nerd cave all set up. Me and my old man built a custom desk so I could have my Xbox, my computer, and my Switch. It's not a fancy setup like I've seen online, but I love it. Even more that the desk is mine. There are a few wobbly cuts. Paint's not dried like I thought it would, but it's perfect to me. So naturally, after finishing it and testing it, making sure that things were in reach when I sat down, I had to show off. So a few pictures were taken and shared online, because the internet is mainly for bragging and showing off. I had a message from my aunt saying that as I'm an adult, I shouldn't be playing silly games and that I should give her kids the Switch. Naturally, I said no, but I promised if I got bored with it, I will message her offspring the first chance to buy it. I don't think she approved as she left me on red. That all happened at the start of the year, but then everything started and I thought nothing more of it. Now, after most of the year being on furlough, restrictions are easing off and I'm back at the office working. The other day, I get a phone call from my mom. She's at my place with my auntie to pick up the switch I had promised to my cousins. Now, I had let a friend of mine borrow it because him and his wife were thinking about one and wanted to try it. I told my mom, just wait, I'm finishing in a few minutes and I'll be there. I get home and sure enough, I see mom's car and auntie's car. I burst through the door and made mom and auntie jump. Me looking at my aunt. What do you think you're doing here? Aunt, I'm here for that switch. You said I could have it. Me, I said if I get rid of it, I'll sell it to you. Mom, you told me you bought it off of him. Me, well, it ain't here. Aunt, well, I'll take the other thing. I started walking to her before mom calmed me down. Me, get out now and I never want to see your face here. If I do, I'm phoning the police. Aunt quickly left and mom started apologizing to me and told me how aunt said she bought it off of me, but it said that we were struggling to organize a time for her to pick it up. I looked at her and all I could say was, I want my spare key back. Now I'm being bombarded by my sister and brother about how I made mom cry, but I asked them, how would you like it if mom was going through your stuff and giving away your expensive crap? Speaking of Switch, what's better, the Xbox or the Switch? Please let us know. Neither, PC gaming for the win. Am I the jerk for telling my brother to move out when he objected to me having a baby? I'm 26, female, and seven months pregnant. The dad won't be involved, but I have a girlfriend who will be. There was no cheating. My brother is 20 and he's staying with me while he attends uni. He's heading into his final year where he'll be writing his dissertation. I own this three bedroom, 1.5 bathroom flat with a mortgage. The deal is that while my brother stays here, dad pays the mortgage and I cover the expenses, both of which are about 500 pounds a month. I told my brother about the baby a couple of months ago. He just sort of said, okay, and had no strong reaction, good or bad. I felt it was a little underwhelming, but didn't question it. A few hours later, he asked if he can still stay here when the baby comes, and I said of course he can, and that was it. About a month after that, he asked me about my childcare plans. I outlined my fairly comprehensive plan. He said that's good, because he's not helping out. I said I didn't expect him to. Then two nights ago, I finished up the nursery in the spare bedroom, though the baby probably won't be in there for at least a few months after the birth. Brother asked me what the nursery at my girlfriend's place looks like, and I responded that my girlfriend doesn't have a nursery at her place. My brother asked if that meant the baby would be here every night. I said that I'm the mother. Of course the baby will be here with me. My brother then went off on me, saying I should have made that clearer because this is going to mess up his studies. Evidently, he thought that as I spent about half my time at my girlfriend's place, this would continue, and me and the baby would also spend half our time at my girlfriend's place post-birth. I explained that as I am the birth mother and I'm the one with enough space for the baby, the baby will be staying here every night. My brother then said that's unreasonable. He's doing his dissertation. How do I expect him to sleep with a screaming baby in the flat, function on the daily, or bring girls back to the flat? He then said that I should move out because I'm the one moving a baby in. Never mind that I literally own the flat. At this point, I told him that this is my flat and he could either stop being a brat and leave or he could move out. 
but I'm not leaving my flat, and I'm not going to listen to him complain about free accommodation. He then told me to buzz off and went to bed. I saw him this morning, and he looked at me like he was waiting for something, but said nothing, so I kept quiet. Dad has since texted me, saying that my brother told him everything, and while I was in the right for most of the conversation, I lost the high ground when I called him a brat, told him to buzz off, and rubbed the free accommodation in his face, and I should apologize for what I said. Am I the jerk? If yes, I'll apologize. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her brother? Please let us know. I think Uniboy needs to find somewhere else to write his dissertation. So, my hair isn't acceptable? Let's see about that. This takes place in the early 2000s. I was working in a video slash DVD rental store at the time and was only a couple of weeks into the job but was enjoying my time there. At the store was me, two managers, other guy working the register, and the regional manager for the area. I've always liked having a splash of color in my hair and it had never been an issue with employment until this instance. At the time, I had my natural brunette hair short and spiked up with a blue patch at the front, which happened to be the same shade as our employee shirts, which pleased me. One day, a few weeks into the job, the regional manager walked in, a woman with a chip on her shoulder the size of her ego. She did her checks on how the store was running, etc., and was talking to me as I was the newest employee there, making sure I knew what I was doing and stuff. As she finishes up, she says offhand to me, By the way, you'll have to take that color out of your hair. I want it gone before my next visit. This surprised me, as I'd read the employee handbook to make sure I was following all uniform guidelines and made sure it wasn't an issue with the two shop managers, so I asked her why I had to change my hair. She instantly got huffy and puffed out her chest and said, Because I told you to. Are you questioning me? Me. No, I was just wondering what guidelines I've broken, as I've read the employee and uniform regulations and didn't see anything about hair color in there and want to be sure I haven't missed something. Regional Manager Because I told you so, and it's an unnatural hair color, you'll have to get rid of it. That annoyed me, as I've never liked having to do something just because, so I told her. Well, other guy at the register has bleached tips. Manager 1 dyes her hair blonde, and Manager 2 has maroon hair. None of those are their natural colors, so I don't understand why I'm getting singled out. Regional Manager did not like this, and since she couldn't give me an answer, just repeated, Because I'm your boss, and I told you so, and if you don't want to change your hair, you can leave. I will be here next week, and I want that color gone. So I said, I understand, I'll fix it, no worries. But just to be clear, so I'm in keeping with your guidelines, other guy, manager one, and manager two have acceptable color and styles? To which she said yes, and I asked, and is my hairstyle okay? Did you want me to cut it a certain way or anything, or is it just the color? She started getting annoyed again and said, You can keep it like that, just get rid of the color. So I confirmed that I would have it sorted before she came in next week, which seemed to satisfy the beast, and she walked off in a cloud of smugness at having laid down her law. As soon as she was out of the door, I told the shop managers what I was going to do, and they laughed, but said they'd have my back when she came in again. So my blue patch of hair had to go, no problem. Colored tips, dyed blonde hair, and maroon hair like the other staff had were all hunky-dory. So that weekend, I did all three to be on the safe side. I bleached all my hair near transparent blonde with maroon tips, spiked up in my usual style as apparently that wasn't an issue. Well, turns out that that's not what the regional manager had in mind. Well, surprise. She came in the next week and lost it took me in the back with the two shop managers, shouting about how I was blatantly ignoring her and that she was going to see to it that I was fired. I acted innocent and surprised and said that I had checked with her that this would be okay before she left. My hairstyle was fine, colored tips on the other guy was fine, and she had confirmed that the maroon hair the shop manager had was fine. She was not backing down and assured me she had report me to the head office for my disrespecting a regional manager like that. She stormed out of the shop on her merry way. So again, I told the two shop managers what I was going to do, which was get in touch with the head office's HR department myself, as I was following all written company regulations as well as the regional manager's arbitrary rules, and she seemed to be discriminating against me personally for whatever reason, and I would be pursuing unfair dismissal as there was no reason to fire me. I was good at my job and got on well with all the customers and staff. It was only the regional manager out to get me, so I did just that emailed the head office's HR saying what had happened, and the two shop managers also emailed on my behalf, backing up that I was following all guidelines, including the ones the regional manager made up, 
and that I was a model employee, for them anyways, but I liked them. And they would attest that I was being singled out and harassed by the regional manager if I got dismissed because of this. The next day, the shop managers called me in to say that HR had been in touch and that of course I wasn't going to be fired and there is no company guidelines for things like hair color and not to worry at all about it. Have my hair any way I wanted once it wasn't unkempt. Awesome, that's all I wanted. Happy ending. Now, let's do this super duper happy ending. Couple weeks later, the new regional manager walked in to introduce themselves. Turns out, I wasn't the only one having issues with the regional manager being on a power trip. After they had several complaints from staff and managers in different stores throughout the area, she was demoted to a regular store manager. I was the straw that broke their back, it seems. Have you ever had a manager single you out for something? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I'm singling you out right now for forgetting to smash that like button. Don't be like that, bruh. Am I the jerk for telling my bro that he can only have my secret recipes if he pays me for them? So, my brother is a tech whiz. He developed an app for his daughter who just started kindergarten. It's customized for her, addresses her by her name, that sort of thing, to help her with her sight words and counting. This is not something he's planning to sell or anything, it was just a fun little project. Anyway, during a Zoom chat a little while ago, he had Nice show off all of the fun new skills she's learned thanks to his app. I was like, that's amazing, and asked if he could share it with me, so I could get my own daughter using it. She'll be in kindergarten next year. He initially said no because it was customized for Nice. I asked how hard it would be to modify, but he said that's not the point. He said if I wanted a custom-built app, I'd have to pay for it. When I asked how much, he sent me a quote. Suffice to say, it was way more than I had expected. I asked if instead of making all the changes for me, could he just send me the source code so I could figure out how to customize it for my daughter on my own time? I'd never share it or sell it. He again told me no, saying it wasn't fair to ask him to hand over the end result of his hard work without appropriate compensation. Fine, fair. I accepted this and didn't bring it up again. Fast forward to a couple of weekends ago. We were having a socially distanced potluck at my parents' house. My mom asked for me to bring two specific dishes, a main and a dessert, which are kind of family favorites that I have made for many gatherings in the past. These are both recipes I've spent years perfecting and include ingredients slash techniques that aren't found in any of the generic recipes I found online. Anyways, sister-in-law was raving about my dishes, saying she even tried to recreate them at home the last time she had had them, but couldn't get it to come out right. Bro then asked if I would email him my specific recipes. Here's where Bro thinks I became the jerk. I said I'd have to work out how much they were worth. When he asked what I meant, I said, it's not fair to ask me to hand over the end result of my hard work without appropriate compensation. Well, he got mad and started calling me petty and saying the two situations are entirely different. I said, I don't see how. A recipe is just a way to program food to taste a specific way. He just kept insisting it was different. Eventually, sister-in-law convinced him that it wasn't worth it, but things were a bit tense between us for the rest of the day, and he's been really short with me ever since. Every time we talk, he makes some kind of comment about it. He likes to be right. The last time we spoke, he brought up that source code is copyrightable, but recipes aren't, which proves it's different. I just said, all the more reason not to share them then. But I'm beginning to wonder, is it different? Am I the jerk here? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his brother? Please let us know. I just want to know what those recipes were. It sounded really good. Karen threatens to call the police for a pet hotel keeping her dog from her. I work at a dog hotel that caters to wealthier clientele. And since I'm a canine caretaker, I feed slash walk slash train slash give medicines to the dogs and don't deal so much with people, which I'm very grateful for. Still, there are times when I bring a dog to clients who then turn out to be entitled Karens or Kins. Not much fun when they act stuck up and arrogant, right? Well, here's a story about the night shift yesterday at work that gets interesting. I was taking a poodle mix named Curly out for a walk, and I got a call on my walkie saying that Curly's owner was waiting to pick him up. It's hotel policy to take the dogs out to go before they return to their owners. This entitled Karen didn't get the memo, so when I passed in the hall with Curly heading outside, she was shrieking so loudly that I could hear her through two closed door hallway sections. In the hotel, each hall is blocked by doors, so if a dog escapes one of the suite rooms, they'll still be partially contained. Anyway, Curly did his business and we were headed to the lobby and to Karen. Her conversation was recorded on security cameras, so our conversation went like this. Karen, I want my dog. 
Give me my fur baby. Come here, Curly. Karen storms into the building, even though no one's allowed in without a mask or permission, which of course she had neither. Karen. Curly, my baby boy. Receptionist. Ma'am, you can't be in here. The canine caretakers take your dog outside to you. Shut up and give me my dog. Receptionist. D do you have a leash? It's hotel policy. The dogs can't go without- No, I don't have a leech. Give yours to me. Referring to me. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but this is my leash. If you'd like a leash, I'll get you one of our spares. No, I want yours. Ma'am, please don't yell. I'd hate to have Curly feel anxious. Then give me your leash. I'm sorry. No. Fine, then. I'll just take my dog and go. Don't expect me to do business with you again. Me. Gives Curly to Karen. Me, realizing my mistake. Ma'am, it's hotel policy that we can't let dogs leave here without a leash or harness. I'd still be happy to get you a spare if you'd like. Karen. Just give me my dog. I don't have time for this bull or for you, B. Me, getting sarcastic. But Curly is a boy, ma'am. How can he be the B? I knew I could have gotten fired over this, but it was a worth it comment. Karen. If you don't give me my dog, then I'll sue you for keeping him from me. This is illegal. I'll have you in court. By now, one of my coworkers was running to Karen and me with one of our spare leashes and gave it to her. She yelled at us several times, but left and swore never to do business with us again. We have Karens and Kens like this all the time who say they'll never come back to the pet hotel again. After the Karen left, my manager came up to me and told me I had some courage. Then this morning, he texted me and said that Karen came back with Curly because she had to go to the city and Curly couldn't go with her. All she requested, in colorful terms, was that I know what I did. Yes, Karen, I know what I did. Followed hotel policy and dealt with an entitled Karen I hope to never see again. I know I will have to, eventually, but today's my day off, so I'm enjoying it. Speaking of dogs, do any of you have a dog? And if so, what kind? Please let us know. My poodle is better than yours. Am I the jerk for telling my wife I won't give her an allowance every month? Me, male 23, and my wife, female 22, got married two months ago. She moved 100 miles away from her family and friends to live with me in my city. We live in a three-bedroom, new-build home with a nice, spacious garden. My wife currently has no job since she left hers to live with me. She's been having a very hard time finding a job since everything that's been going on. I work full-time and earn 3,000 pounds a month. I also rent out a property of my father's, which covers our rent for our new home. I pay for the groceries and anything the house needs. She covers the car insurance, Wi-Fi, and her own bills with her savings. I must say, my wife is a very good stay-at-home wife. She cooks very nice meals and bakes these amazing cakes for me every few days. She makes me pancakes in the mornings, as hers are honestly the best I've ever had, and she makes sure my lunch is packed and dinner is on the table when I get home. Also, the house is spotless. Last night, she expressed to me how she was running low on her savings. I cover literally everything, so I'm not too sure what she spends her money on. Anyways, she told me she would like 100 pounds a month so she can use it for her creams she applies at night or just so she can get her nails done and use it to feel nice. I told her I won't be giving her any allowance and if she needs anything like her nails done or her creams to just ask me instead and I'll transfer her the amount. She got into a mood because I said no but I reminded her how I'm the one who's covering everything anyways and how I don't even want her to work because she doesn't need to. Am I the jerk for refusing her request? Because she did get into a mood the entire evening and acted just off. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or not? Please let us know. Bruh. Am I the jerk for being upset about my boyfriend's mom kicking me out because I cried in front of his family? My boyfriend, who's 23, and I, who am 21, have been together for three years now. I've been aware for a while that his mom doesn't like me and has had her concerns, as she puts it, about our relationship. I'm not entirely sure why, and my boyfriend doesn't understand why either. Currently, my boyfriend is living at home with his parents, and I'm doing the same, as we both graduated college in May and are working on moving out. He invited me to come over Labor Day weekend to spend time with him. His family, which consists of his mom, dad, sister, and brother-in-law, spent most of the day teasing me and making fun of me over almost anything I said or did. Like, they wanted to go outside and throw frisbee, and I have horrible aim, so they kept mocking me. His dad even threw a frisbee from a position where I couldn't see him with the intention of hitting me with it because he knew I wasn't paying attention. I didn't think it was funny, but I played along. Then before dinner, they decided to play a game. 
It's a card game and there are ways to get people out in the game early on and they can't play again until the next round. His family thought it would be funny to mess with me. The entire game, I was targeted to the point where I was the only one with no points and I barely even got to play during every round. Even when it would make more strategic sense to play on someone else who was close to winning, they would play on me. One of his family members even said that it was fun to watch me lose. They were also making fun of me for any mistake in the game I made, when I've played only a few times before. At that point, it was getting to me, and after I made another mistake and they all started laughing at me, I started crying because I was embarrassed and then excused myself. When my boyfriend came to talk to me, he told me that his mom wanted me to leave because she wasn't going to deal with this. She also told him that he should break up with me because I'm too sensitive and if I can't take a joke, I can't be part of their family. I explained to him why I was upset and he understood, but he couldn't go against his mom. I cried for a while and grabbed my things, but before I left, I went to go apologize to his mom for making a scene. His mom told me she thinks I'm bad for him. I'm weak. She can't ever see me as a mother or a wife and I ruin everything when I'm around. I even asked his mom what I had done to make her feel that way about me, but she couldn't answer the question. I didn't know what to say, so I just stayed quiet and left when she was done. My boyfriend then told me he needs a few days to think about things because he wants to be with someone who perfectly meshes with his family like his brother-in-law. I'm devastated and I feel like it's my fault for getting upset, but I also feel like his mom's reaction crossed a line. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend's mom? Please let us know. I made my boss retire and took her lab equipment as a trophy. I'm a second year graduate student going for a PhD in biochemistry. As such, I'm simultaneously both a student and government employee working for my university as a researcher. The way my program is laid out, you take a general course for the first semester, then rotate into three or more labs, doing work for and learning techniques from the professors running said labs for a few months before moving on. After your third rotation in a lab, you're allowed to join the lab permanently as you work on your thesis project. As far as my circumstances went, I didn't like my first lab. Everyone had a thick Chinese accent that made it hard to really hear what the professor slash lab techs were saying, although they were great people. The second lab didn't have funding to pay me as a grad student, leaving me with my third rotation lab. I opted to join that lab as the project seemed extremely interesting and was in neuroscience, meaning I would be able to learn techniques others in my program would not and I was very interested by that prospect. About a week after joining, the head of the biochemistry department reached out to me. Apparently, the older students I know had gone to him with concerns about the professor I would be working with, so he started digging. Apparently, the neuro and molecular medicine programs no longer allow her to take graduate students from their programs at all because she was known for having fits, throwing tantrums, throwing things, and being an all-around jerk in general. I later found out that she was read the riot act on multiple occasions and tried to deny maternity leave to a pregnant student from one of the programs which later blacklisted her because she couldn't understand why a student, who was about 28 at the time, would get pregnant, just to give you some context for her demeanor. I was concerned by the rumors, but it seemed to be a stark contrast to the person I was working with. Boy, was I wrong about that. I was told to watch out and keep the department in the loop. Fast forward a few months and progress has slowed to a crawl. The project I had been working on turned out to be wrong and the preliminary data was done by an undergraduate student who, upon revisiting the lab, couldn't replicate her own results because she messed up her data a bit to seem better so she could get out of the lab faster. Fast forward again and communication between my boss and I have broken down. Every email I receive has text in bold, italicized, and underlined font to get it clearly across that she was talking down to me. She no longer offers me help, stating that she doesn't have time for me, but whenever something goes wrong or doesn't work, I'd be asked, why didn't you ask for help? She was hypocritical or self-contradicting on most points, however it best suited her at the time. I found myself walking much more quickly past her office to avoid eye contact and the hour and a half long lectures slash rants that would normally follow. Worked later hours to enjoy the peace and quiet of night. One project I was working on involved injecting lentivirus, an HIV based agent used essentially as a molecular syringe to get cells to express whatever DNA we wanted them to into the brains of mice. 
which were either a disease model or a control model. I won't go into detail here, but essentially I had to do practice runs before we spent thousands of dollars on disease model mice and ultra pure lentivirus. These practices were carried out flawlessly and I showed my boss exactly where I had injected the mice. Again, I won't go into the details. However, every time I showed her where I had injected the practice solution, which was fluorescent, she would say, that's not the region of the brain you're supposed to be injecting. I want to see a one region of the hippocampus. Unbeknownst to me, this jerk had no idea what that region of the brain looked like and was looking for the wrong part of the brain. She worked in the neuro department, gave me the coordinates to inject into this region herself, and worked alongside labs that specialized in this. After we had well exceeded the amount of practice surgeries permitted in her grant, I realized that she was an idiot and showed her a mouse atlas, highlighting the area of the brain to be injected and showed her a side-by-side -side image comparison to my real injections. Furthermore, the atlas had coordinates that showed you that my injections were as accurate as possible. After a bit of stammering, she brought me outside and pointed to a poster on the wall. I wanted you to do this injection. Why didn't you inject this? She was pointing at a different, further forward region of the brain. I showed her the coordinates she herself had provided me with for the surgery and told her, because you didn't tell me to. By this point, we had one week until the actual surgeries were to be done. In a panic, my boss told me to do a practice run with brand new coordinates. This was crappy because it took me a week just to find out if the coordinates worked or not and if they didn't, I wouldn't be able to test any corrections before the surgery. Additionally, she had apparently put off mandatory veterinary training and demanded that I do the new coordinate surgery in front of a vet who, if he had a problem with my techniques, be it with the animal or with sterility of my tools, would not allow me to do the surgery and would effectively end my project. While this wouldn't normally be a problem, my crappy boss was using a neighboring lab's equipment which I had no way of cleaning or sterilizing prior to the surgery. Everything rested on the other lab. Through some miracle, everything in the surgery suite was up to standards. Filters had just been replaced. The place had just been swept, trash removed, and the equipment was recently autoclaved. I got a pass from the vet on my technique, but was told that I couldn't do the surgery for safety reasons. I would have to do it in a more controlled environment with more personal protective gear if I was using lentivirus, which again was impossible since we were borrowing another lab's equipment which couldn't be moved. After some discussion, I'm told by my boss to just throw on a respirator and do the surgery anyways. The day of the surgery comes, I'm ready. I anesthetize, knock out, two of the mice and start the surgery. About half an hour into the surgery, I notice that they've both stopped breathing. This had never happened before. I grab the neighboring lab staff to help and they tried to resuscitate the mice with an adapted form of CPR, but it was no use. They were gone. After 30 practice mice injected this way ended up just fine, these expensive mice had died. I would just like to point out that I have never before nor have I since lost an animal during surgery. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. These mice were supposed to be anesthetized with a drug mixture injection, but since my boss never got the license to obtain that mixture, she disobeyed her approved protocol and had us use other means of anesthetizing the mice. It turns out that this particular line of mice was exceptionally fragile and wouldn't be able to live under our method of anesthesia. However, we were collaborating with another lab which was doing half of the surgeries for us. This lab had the license to obtain and use the mixture. Those mice survived. Due to the disparity between their success and our failure, I'm pointed out as the problem, despite my arguments. Fast forward a few months, and my boss and I both arrive at the conclusion that neither of us wants me there anymore. I go to the head of the biochemistry department and tell the biochem head about my decision. He asks me what happened, and I said, it just didn't work out. I was still trying to just drop it and let the whole thing just slip into the past. However, it turns out my boss had been angrily writing him behind my back for months about everything that she didn't like. He was extremely tired of it. I was outraged by the fact that instead of talking with me about these things like an adult, she went behind my back to my department head. But what really upset me is that she was also apparently spreading lies about me to the head of my department, hoping she could get me kicked out of the graduate school 
so her reputation wouldn't get tarnished further and she would continue to take students from my department. After this essay of exposition, cue the revenge. The head of the biochemistry department just set me down, told me that he would give me a list of grievances levied against me by my boss and asked me to address them in a formal letter which would be sent in to a governing committee which would deliberate on what course of action the department should take with me leaving the lab. The letter included lies that I would have to disprove. This was easily done and I was able to cite witnesses as well. Blamed me for the deaths of the expensive animals and wasting the lentivirus and several other points. I took my time writing a rebuttal letter. After approximately 24 pages, I was satisfied with my work. I outlined how the premise for my project was based on falsified data how my boss ignored her IACUC approved surgery protocol for convenience which actually led to the deaths of the animals appended with an email from the veterinarian regarding this to support my claim. How my boss unnecessarily used animals for training surgeries beyond three times the allowed amount in her protocol solely because she couldn't even identify the region she wanted me to inject. How she would constantly harass, threaten, and demean me with witnesses from the neighboring lab cited. How she would constantly forget even talking to me about things and claim that I was lying about things she witnessed. I honestly think she had Alzheimer's, but the neighboring lab thinks it's a form of traumatic brain injury. I even included a note to EHS, the safety department, about the breach and safety protocol regarding use of lentivirus without proper airflow control and without proper personal protective equipment. Every single documented safety violation, protocol violation, Harassment or threat was included in my letter. I didn't hear back from the head of the department, but word got around fast through the department even though it was supposed to be secret. The professor was blacklisted from the university as a whole and could no longer take on students from any program, meaning she could only hire lab techs and postdocs. Additionally, the only other person in her lab who basically carried the lab and knew everything just left today. With that, the lab has officially been retired. My old boss is no longer with the university and I even got to enjoy going through her lab equipment to appropriate for my new lab since it was all technically property of the university. It was the greatest feeling of satisfaction I've ever had. Aunt takes advantage of my grandparents to steal our house. She gets put in her place. Backstory. My dad has an older sister who will call entitled aunt. And always, even as a kid, my grandparents treated her like an angel and treated my dad like crap. For example, when my dad was in college, he wore clothes that had holes that were about 3 inches wide and the tradition in China is that you get a brand new set of clothes in the new year. His mom told him that they were going to get him a brand new coat for the winter and my dad got really excited. A few days before New Year's though, his parents said that they can't get him a coat. The coat they were going to get him cost 1,000 yuan. 143 US dollars. But can you guess where that money went? Entitled Dance Boyfriend. How can you treat your son like that? Here's something worse. The coat they gave the boyfriend was 2,000 yuan. You could have just split the dang money so they both could have had coats. The second my dad was out of college, he started working his butt off. He was able to give his parents money every year even when they treated him like crap. Later finding out that every year all that money goes to Entitled Dan. But that's a different story. You get the gist. My dad treats his parents really well and all that effort equals nothing or it goes straight to Entitled Aunt. Story. For some reason, they hated my dad, mom, me, and my siblings. This happened a few years ago when my mom was giving birth to my brother. I didn't realize how bad this story was until a few years ago because I didn't understand. So I was born in Beijing. My mom was somehow able to foresee that prices in houses were going to go up in there. So she and my dad worked hard to buy as many houses as they could. However, there is a limit to how many houses you can buy in Beijing, but my mom was able to find a loophole. She bought the houses with her own money, but put the house under someone else's name. She bought a house and put the house under my dad's mom's name. My mom paid for all the renovation, important later. Fast forward about four years, my mom was pregnant with my brother. There's a law in China that says no having more than one baby so they came to the US to legally have the baby. This is where Entitled Aunt saw her chance. She took advantage of my parents' absence to manipulate my grandparents, telling them to put the house my mom bought four years ago under Entitled Aunt's husband. Obviously, my grandparents caved in really easily and transferred it. 
Luckily, my mom's brother, I didn't know, was able to find that they had transferred it. Now, we were still in the US, so we weren't able to deal with this immediately. My parents called their lawyers to have a court summon for Entitled Aunt. She took her time and waited for the last warning to finally come into court. She brought my grandparents along too. According to my uncle, she was smirking the entire time waiting for the trial to begin, thinking that our side of the court can't really prove it, while low-key insulting our side of the family. I don't know how to translate this, but she said things like, My brother has always been naughty. He probably also passed it down to his kids too. Or, My brother was such a coward. He didn't even want to come because he knew I would win. Then came the sweet revenge. The court first asked Entitled Aunt to talk. She said that the house was bought by my grandmother and was then given to her husband, obviously with no proof. Then my uncle with the lawyers took out a record, clearly stating that my mother purchased this house with her own money. I wish I could have seen Entitled Aunt's face, but my uncle described it as a dark green and maybe a little purple too. The judge then asked Entitled Aunt if this was true. The judge stated that if she was to lie, she would end up with much worse than just giving the house back. Surprisingly, she still stood her ground and claimed that the house was indeed her husband's, who got the house from grandmother and paid for renovations. That's when she messed up. My uncle and the lawyers triumphantly took out another paper saying that my mother paid for all of the renovations, clearly not my aunt's husband. And that's when she broke down. She started crying, screaming in an undecipherable language. She was then taken to jail for about one to two years, I forgot, but wow, she deserved it. That got a load off my chest. This annoyed me for the longest time. My mom also told me a lot of other stories about Entitled Aunt and my grandparents, and they're pretty dang triggering. Have you ever had an aunt that you just couldn't stand? If so, what was wrong with them? Please let us know. Oh, my nieces and nephews love me. Skip on a high school senior tradition? How about a double serving of malicious compliance instead? This isn't my story, but it happened to some high school classmates of mine in the late 90s. Unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to be a part of it. The AP Calculus class teacher had a tradition that held up for at least a decade, where if you brought your college acceptance letter, you'd be invited to his breakfast club. Essentially, instead of taking the math final exam for the year, he'd provide transportation to the local IHOP, buy everyone breakfast, and shoot the breeze together. The gesture was a popular and welcome one. After all, these were the brightest kids in the school, the top 10%, including the valedictorian and the salutatorian the captain of the debate team, and others. Taking a final exam when they were already assured their places in Ivy League schools was a pointless formality after all. The year this story happened, however, there was a new teacher who made a big deal about how unfair the breakfast club was. Funnily enough, her name was Karen. The school's vice principal came in and told the class that they would stay in the school with everyone else and take the final exam or they'd face in-school suspension. The AP calculus teacher had his hands tied so on the day of the test, a Friday, the whole class came in and took their test, which consisted of a single question, what's your name? The students looked up to see a crap-eating grin on the teacher's face and they quickly caught on. Everyone filled in their papers, submitted them, and then they went off to IHOP. Perfect test scores for everyone. By the time the weekend was over, the whole school knew the story and Karen must have complained to the vice principal one more because he came in and gave in-school suspension tickets to the entire class. It was truly an odd sight to see the school's geniuses file into the ISS room, only to find their AP Calc teacher who had volunteered for monitor duties or swapped with a normal monitor or something. And he had brought bags of bagels, cream cheese, whitefish spread, and butter for everyone serving suspension that day. Mr. Buckley, you're a legend. Speaking of in-school suspension, did you ever get suspended for anything? And if so, what was it? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for tweaking my roommate's mom's recipe, which led to my roommate having a meltdown? I've been living with my roommate for the past year. We're not friends by any means, but we do get along well. She's vegan, and I suspect she might have OCD, but I've never questioned her. We've had a few problems here and there, but overall, we respect each other and get along well. I met her mother once when she came to visit long before all of this started. One day, she made this amazing vegan lasagna for her daughter, and she saved me a plate too. It tasted amazing, especially the sauce. I asked her for the recipe and she gladly gave it to me. I tried that recipe once before and it tasted very close to the original. I saved some for my roommate and she was also impressed. Then all this craziness started and both of us were stuck in the state and haven't visited our family in months. Few weeks ago, my boyfriend wanted to have a date night at my place. I decided to cook for him. 
I cooked the chicken lasagna. I used my roommate's mother's recipe for the sauce, and I also changed the substitutes. I used ricotta and mozzarella instead of cashew cream. I used Parmesan cheese instead of vegan Parmesan. We were almost done with the dinner when roommate came home. She said she wouldn't be home until much later. She immediately recognized the smell and then said, Please, please, please tell me you saved me a plate. That smells amazing. I told her I didn't make extra because it wasn't vegan and she wouldn't eat it. Boy, that was the wrong thing to say. She screamed at me about how much of a jerk I was and how wrong it was for me to use her mother's recipe in a way that she won't even be able to touch. She told me it was cruel of me to do this, especially because of how homesick she was. She also told me it was disgusting that I turned a vegan recipe into something immoral like this. And I don't mean that she yelled. She screamed at the top of her lungs, and I think she might have started throwing things around soon. Then my boyfriend got upset and asked her to please be respectful and to calm down. He told her that it was no big deal, and recipes get tweaked all the time. This agitated her more, and she started pulling her own hair painfully. At this point, I just asked him to go to my room and tried to calm her down. This also didn't help. She kept pulling her hair more and was looking around wildly. In the end, she went to her room and slammed the door. I could hear all sorts of noise from her room, like crying, throwing stuff, etc. I thought of talking to her, but I didn't exactly know how to handle this, so I just went into my room. My boyfriend thinks she was way out of line. My roommate obviously thinks that I'm being cruel to her for no reason. I am terribly conflicted, and I don't know if I overstepped. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her roommate? Please let us know. I just want some of that lasagna, bruh. Sounds so good. Mm, yeah. My mother forced me to ride a horse. I got hurt. My mother is not a good person, and when thinking of ways to describe her, a few names come to mind. Annie Wilkes from Misery and Margaret White from Carrie, just to name a few. Stephen King depicted my mother quite nicely in those books. My younger sister was my mom's golden child. She lived up to all of my mother dearest's high expectations and liked doing everything that our mom did, like riding horses. I was never interested in doing any of it, probably because of her poor treatment towards me for most of my childhood. My mom and dad had separated when I was very young, but they were civil around each other for the benefit of me and my siblings. At this point, my dad and family members on my dad's side didn't know the things my mom did to me and my brother. I can remember this day so vividly. We were visiting my aunt and her husband, my dad's sister, who lived on a farm. They were all interested in riding horses, but knew that I wasn't, which was never an issue to them. My mother, on the other hand, wasn't so understanding. My sister, five at the time, was riding around on a pony with my uncle walking beside her and I was sitting on the veranda watching her. My brother had walked off down the driveway a few hours before this, so he was nowhere in sight. While sitting and watching, my mother walked up to me. My dad was with my aunt on the other side of the farm. Mom, why won't you come and ride with your sister? Me, because I don't want to. Mom, don't be a spoiled brat. Get up off your lazy butt now. Me, Mom, you know I don't like riding horses and I'm not good at it. Please don't make me. Mom, getting visibly angry. Get up now, you lazy little jerk. She grabbed me and pulled me hard and fast off of the chair. I fell down and screamed out in pain. Stop, my wrist. Mom, stop being a souk and get up. My wrist hurt so bad and began to throb in pain, but whenever I said something about it, mom just accused me of faking it to get out of doing things. She walked me over to where my dad and aunt were, her dragging me by my wrist, and when we got there, my dad noticed I was crying. Dad, what's wrong? Are you okay? Mom, she's fine. She wants to ride a horse. Me, no I don't. I was cut off. Yes you do. You want to ride the big horse, don't you? All of my objections were ignored by my mom and she made my dad help me onto a horse. The big horse was a Clydesdale. Anyone who knows about horses will know that a Clydesdale is far too big for an average inexperienced horse rider, let alone an eight-year-old. And this horse was easily spooked, so having a new person on his back that didn't know what they were doing was enough to spook him. He jerked forward quickly and knocked me off. I landed in the grass with my hands taking most of the impact, which made the pain in my wrist even more. The impact wasn't hard enough to break it, but it was already broken before I'd gotten onto the horse. My mom came rushing over to me to see if I was okay. Mom, doing her best fake concerned mother act. Oh, you poor thing. Are you okay? Let me help you up. Me. My wrist. It hurts. Mom. Oh no. You must have broken it when you fell. Dad took me to the hospital and it was broken. When I told dad what she had done, he didn't believe me. Not because he was a neglectful parent, 
but because he saw me fall onto my hands, so he put two and two together. Most of my cries for help as a kid fell on deaf ears. I spent the next eight weeks with my wrist in a cast, which made school hard, as I couldn't hold a pen. It was my right wrist, and I'm right-handed. I want to say that this is the worst thing my mother has ever done, but I'm sad to say it isn't. I'm no longer in contact with her, and my life is better without her in it. Edit. There seems to be a misunderstanding about my father enabling her, so I wanted to clarify. He didn't know what she was like back then. My mother was very good at covering her tracks and making what she did look like accidents. It wasn't until many years after this that he began to see who she really was. In case you're wondering, my sister and I are really close now, and I hold no resentment towards her for being the favorite child. She hates her as much as I do now and isn't in contact with her either. Karen is angry that we aren't mind readers like the other store. My place of work, a grocery superstore, has a drive-up option available for customer use. It's extremely user-friendly. All you do is add the items you want to your cart, place the order, decide if you would like it to be taken out to your car or if you'd like to pick it up in the store and wait for a confirmation email once we've put together your order. It also includes a handy feature to let us know when you're on your way to the store and then when you have arrived, and our handheld devices give us alerts for that. Countless people let us know that they are on their way only a few seconds before they arrive, to which you can hear a shout from a disgruntled employee in the back room quickly trying to pull together their order from the places scattered around the storage space. But while annoying, that is manageable and understandable, especially for first-time users of the system. However, a particular woman that visited me today took that mildly inconvenient scenario, tossed it out the window, and then drew up plans for something indefinitely worse. I'm running the front for customer service, which doubles as where people can pick up their orders for in-store placements. When this older woman storms up to me, not very unusual, so I just try to smile with my eyes. Because yes, some people have stated that our workers are unfriendly due to their forced customer service smiles being hidden behind a mask and ask how I can help her. I was waiting for my order to be brought out to me for 20 minutes. She all but screams at me. Not exactly common, but nobody had been out in that area for a while due to a lull in our drive up orders. Occasionally, we'll get a new user that is unfamiliar with the system, but we're usually out in the drive up area often enough to see that someone that we have no notification for is there and go see if we can help them work the app. Thinking that that is the situation, I apologize. I'm really sorry, ma'am. I say, genuinely sorry for this woman who must have been fiddling with her phone for a while trying to get the app to work. I even pull out my device to check and make sure I hadn't missed anything. But sure enough, there were no current drive ups waiting to be fulfilled. It doesn't look like we have any orders right now, so maybe you accidentally forgot to tell us you were coming. It's not your fault. First time users sometimes have difficulty. And that's when this conversation went from understandable to crazy. We've got me and the Karen. Karen, I'm not a first time user. I've used this service hundreds of times and never have I seen such unprofessionalism and rudeness. Me, checking my device to ensure I'm really not just missing her order. I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. However, we never got a confirmation that you were coming, so I- Confirmation? Why the heck would I need to confirm anything? I place the order, I come to the store, you bring me out what I ordered. That's how it works. You shouldn't be working here if I know how your service works better than you. You should have known I was there. Me, of course, ma'am. However, in order to be able to take out your order to you, we need to know when you've arrived. So within the app, there's this handy dandy little thing you press. Karen, now back to screaming. What? This is stupid. Whenever I come to other stores, they always just bring it out to me. What? You guys are just too stupid to do the same? Me, just wanting the conversation to be over. I'm sorry. If I can just see your confirmation email, I can get your order from the back. Confirmation email? What the heck? Just get my order from the back. God, it's like kids these days can't do a darn thing. Me. Ma'am, we'll send you a confirmation email once we've put together your order so that we can verify that it is you picking it up and not somebody else. Look, I just ordered this stuff a few minutes before driving all the way out here. Just look at the top of the orders. And I'm sure that it's mine. It's not that hard. Just get me what I bought. It was obvious she had never gotten a confirmation email, and it was even more obvious that she didn't read the message at the bottom of every order saying that we require 30 minutes to 2 hours to complete said order. This isn't a matter of us being lazy or slow. The number of orders placed and items needing to be gathered, labeled, and sorted correctly in the back rooms require that time frame. I hate to say that I had dropped my customer service voice at that point, but was still trying to be decently polite when attempting to explain that we aren't superhuman mind readers 
and that we need time to get her items together, as well as a notice of when she'd be heading to the store. But no, I couldn't have at least the slightest bit of closure in explaining that in the simplest of terms to her. With the final complaint of how stupid we all were, and how she'd be leaving a bad review, and how I'd be fired within a week, she cut off my explanations and stormed off back to wherever she had come from. This isn't the worst customer interaction I've had by far, but I honestly don't understand any bit of the logic she was trying to convince me of. The process seems really simple to me, but who knows, maybe I'm the entitled one for thinking that everyone should understand it or at least be willing to listen. Maybe there really is some story out there that can just read her mind to find out when she's arriving, gather her order within the time frame she's allotted, and be out there waiting to put it in her car without any sort of confirmation of her ID. Come right back to the office? Don't mind if I do. I was working at yet another soulless call center. Through years of bad ideas, alcohol, and generally getting punched in the face, I had a broken tooth that was no longer serviceable. I could no longer adhere that over-the-counter tooth cement to it, let it dry, and pretend I didn't notice it. It hurt. My face was swollen. I'm pretty sure my breath was fetid. I was trying to move from slacker to adult, so I made an appointment to get it pulled. I was salary, regularly worked weird schedules, but still gave heads up to the brand new shiny directory and HR goon and my supervisor that I was going in for an emergency tooth removal and would be gone for part of the day. My boss? No worries or concerns. He knew I would come in for whatever, whenever. The new director? Not so much. She didn't like me because somebody told her I wasn't nice. You can go on your lunch to do whatever you want, but come right back to the office. This wasn't going to happen. She wasn't in my chain of command, and I only told her out of courtesy. My boss knew I was out. She could be mad. This all changed while I sat in that not-too-comfy chair, already stabbed in the gums a half dozen times to numb it up. The nice front counter lady came in to tell me I didn't have dental insurance. I laughed, explained of course I did, and validated all of my information. She asked to speak to me alone. Apparently, my company had charged me for my insurance, but never paid the insurance company. Even better, the company had done this for every employee on this plan for a while. Oh well, I have the cash, pay for the procedure right then. A little over an hour later, a small bit of my beard is missing from clamps catching in it, stitches in my gums they had cut, and tooth gone. I'm ready to go back to work and ask some questions. After all, they wanted me to come right back, right? I don't even clean up. I leave the blood all over my shirt. There's a little bruising on my face from an oh crap moment when part of the tooth broke more while extracting. I walk right into the nice HR person's office and hand him my receipt. I explain what happened. He calls the director in and starts making calls. Her. Why are you here looking like that? Go clean up. Me. You said come right back. Her. You're a health hazard. Me. If only I had dental insurance, eh? Of course we have insurance. Why would you walk in here like that? Me. You said come right back. This circular exchange lasted about 10 minutes. HR dude needed me to make copies of the receipts. I walked to the furthest possible printers, making sure enough people saw me. They asked what was up. I told everyone what was going on with the insurance. Emails started. Calls started. People were very unimpressed. I got back to the HR office. He's ready to make sure I get reimbursed on the next check, pay back for the insurance I've paid that I don't have insurance for. Him. Okay, well go ahead and head out. You can use my door out. Don't tell anyone about what's going on. Me. Too late. I've told at least 10 people. Director. Why would you do that? Me. Well, you did tell me to come right back. We all got reimbursed. Company put out a big apology memo, bought pizza, because that's what call centers do, and HR guy did a lot of butt kissing. Am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend to leave after she flushed down my allergy pills? I, 26 male, have a chronic respiratory system disease, asthma. I have an allergic reaction to certain foods. My doctor advised me to keep away from these types of foods due to the effect of worsening my condition. My girlfriend, who's 23, keeps cooking trigger foods that are full of dairy and does not seem to understand how my diet works even when I show her. We had argued about this topic a lot. Last night when I came home for dinner, I found out that she used some of the ingredients that I was allergic to. I told her I wasn't going to eat dinner. She blew up, got mad at me, and called me picky and hard to please. She said that I don't appreciate her cooking and that she was tired of me complaining about her dishes. I didn't want to engage in the argument, but she started yelling at me, telling me to eat because she wasn't going to throw away the food and that a single meal won't hurt. I told her no, and I went to make myself some salad. She then tried to mock me and my illness and said that since I didn't want to eat her food because of allergies, 
then I should just stop taking my allergy pills. I called her ridiculous, and that's when she lost it and ran to my room, got my allergy tablets, and flushed them down the toilet. I saw what she was doing, but I wasn't able to yell at her to stop, thinking I don't want to have an asthma attack. I told her to leave because she was causing me stress and I ended up going outside to get some fresh air. She got her stuff and left crying. I called her brother and told him everything. He said it was good that I kicked her out, but I feel bad for her because I understand her frustration, but I can't control it. I had to get new allergy tablets and asked my doctor to give me another copy of my diet so hopefully I could show it to her and she might be able to cook without putting the restricted ingredients in. She isn't responding and is blaming me for what happened. I admit that I was harsh, but she was being unreasonable. Speaking of allergies, are there any foods you're allergic to? And if so, what are they? Please let us know. That's not how this works, lady. A few years ago, I had this lady come in asking about her layaway. She asked me if she only wanted a few pieces out of her layaway, if she had to get the whole layaway out, or if she could just get those few pieces. I told her it was all or none of it, and whatever she didn't get, she's getting the money back for. She said okay and continued to shop around for a bit. Now one thing to note was this was at the height of springtime for allergy sufferers. I have really bad allergies and honestly this day I was riding the struggle bus of being at work. You could tell I wasn't at 100% and that all I wanted to do was go home and sleep. Anyways, so she comes up to the counter to get her layaway out. She picks out the two pieces she wants to keep and tells my coworker she wanted to return the other four pieces. Coworker returns the four pieces she didn't want and gives her the money back. The woman tells her she didn't give her enough back. My coworker looks at her confused and the following conversation takes place. We've got coworker, we've got me, and we've got the customer. Coworker. Yes, ma'am. I gave you back the price of each item as it states on your receipt. Karen. No, you didn't. I had six pieces in my layaway. You still owe me for the other two pieces. Coworker. No, ma'am. You kept those two pieces, so you don't get the money back for them. Karen. Let me speak with your manager. Me. What's going on? Coworker. She wants her money back for her layaway. She had six pieces in the layaway. She paid for the full layaway. Only way to get her pieces out at the time. We ran off a very outdated system. And returned four of the six pieces. See? She shows me the receipts. Me. Ma'am, the math is correct. The register isn't going to mess up something like that. You started with six items, decided that you wanted to return four items and keep two items, which are in your bag. You can't get money back for the full layaway unless you return the two items you kept. Karen, you aren't understanding. Me, yes I am, it's simple math. I grab her four items she didn't want and pulled the other two out of the bags and set them on top of her bag. Now you started out with these six items, right? Yes. And they totaled to this amount. You decided not to get these four items, so you returned them for... I add up the amount. That's right! Okay, so why would you think we owe you for these two items you're keeping? Ugh, you don't get it. She walks away and leaves. Husband grabs her bag and shrugs like he's over it while apologizing and saying he'll talk to her. Our store phone rings a few minutes later and it's her. She then proceeded to tell me she wants to talk this out like mature adults because she doesn't want to call corporate and complain. She said she felt like I didn't care that we ripped her off and that I didn't want to be there and I was very condescending towards her. I stopped her and said I wasn't condescending and said she didn't understand at all and that she can't get items for free, which is what she was telling me she wanted. I told her I'm sorry if it seemed like I didn't want to be there because I really didn't as I did not feel good due to allergies. I told her I really wanted to be home sleeping because I was having a bad allergy attack that day, but I couldn't get anyone to come into work for me. I told her I didn't appreciate the fact that she couldn't understand the simple math problem and to have her husband explain it to her better since he clearly understood what we were saying. I proceeded to tell her to feel free to call my district manager and blah 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 number because I would be calling her as soon as this conversation was over and informing her of the issue. District manager was called and I explained the situation. District manager could tell just by talking to me on the phone that I didn't feel good. I had worked for her for a few years by this point. I faxed her the receipt information so she could look at it. The lady called her 30 minutes later and district manager told her the exact same thing. District manager called me after this conversation and tells me to go home and to get some rest once so and so from another store gets there in 15 minutes. Got screamed at today by Karen over an avocado. I'm full of bitter fury, so if you're a vindictive person, you may enjoy this. Little backstory. I work for a gourmet burger place. Everyone who works during this has seen the inner jerkness of the general public grow and grow. 
We've been slammed and understaffed because three-fourths of our staff decided to quit when this all went down and every 10 minutes our phone rings with some dumb jerk asking, Are you guys open? What time do you close tonight? Can I order random thing not currently offered? First of all, Google answers every question you ask. Just Google the restaurant. Our menu is on the website. Our website is on Google. So anyways, after having the phone ring with the same crap every 5 to 10 minutes at least, and often having 3 or 4 calls come in at the exact same time, my phone customer service voice is slipping. I'm not rude, but I don't have the patience anymore to be all chipper and peppy over the phone. Today I get a call from a guest. Let's call her Jerk. So Jerk calls and asks to order. I politely direct Jerk to the online ordering platform because it will let you know what our new menu is and we've been very busy, so it will help us get your order out more quickly. Jerk says she can't put blue cheese on her burger. I tell Jerk, I'm sorry ma'am, we don't have blue cheese right now. Anything you can't find online, we don't have. Jerk says, well, I wanted guacamole on my burger, but that button isn't there either. Quick separate thought, guacamole and avocado are two different things. I've worked as a server for years. You give somebody avocado when they ask for guacamole, and a crappy person will not hesitate to mess up your day with their poor social etiquette. So anyways, I begin to say to Jerk, We actually don't sell guacamole, ma'am. We did for a while, but only for one month as a special. But we do not have avocado. I only get as far as ma'am. So she cuts me off and says, I've seen burgers with guacamole or avocado or whatever that stuff is called. So I responded to her, completely ignoring that I was interrupted because what else is new? Oh, avocado. Yes, ma'am, we do have that. If you don't see that online, it's an issue. I'm so sorry. I'll go ahead and take your order. Once again, cutting me off, she says, Why would you split hairs between avocado and guacamole? Are you stupid? I respond, Well, guacamole and avocado aren't technically the same thing. And third interruption in a row, this jerk screams at the top of her lungs through the phone, Don't you be a jerk to me! I say for the first time, not trying to hide my irritation, Don't yell at me. I've done nothing to deserve that. She yells some more about how they're the same thing. I explain, if you asked for guacamole and I gave you avocado and you were upset by it, it could cause me to get an unnecessary, uncomfortable situation. And then, showing her truly undeniable stupidity and lack of self-awareness, she retorts, What are you talking about? Who would get upset with someone over avocado? At this point, my voice is flat and clearly upset, but I'm still not being snarky or rude, just abrupt. I retort, People yell at food service workers about all kinds of things. Karen says, Clearly you've had a hard day. I respond, It was fine until a minute ago. What can I get you? The rest of her ordering process, she's very quiet and much more respectful. I hope I broke her. I hope that realizing how mean she was, she broke down crying. I hope her husband leaves her and her kids don't call. Just to be clear, I don't actually have a legitimate problem with people calling and asking what time we close or if we're open. I know times are crazy. It just gets kind of annoying due to how often it happens, but I just wanted to get my frustrations off my chest. Am I the jerk for not letting Karen's family use my Wi-Fi anymore? I'm 26, male, and my internet is pretty bad, let me start off by saying. It only works for one device. I got the cheapest plan because I started some online classes and I was only going to use it for that. My neighbors have a 13-year-old son whose school is doing everything online. Before his class started, they asked me if he could use my Wi-Fi for his school during the day since I'm at work and my classes aren't until later on. I said yeah, and then the problem started. The first week, I was having trouble logging into my classes and my laptop was being very slow. I checked my Wi-Fi and it was connected, so I didn't see the problem. I assumed maybe the neighbors were still connected and I went next door. Turns out, my neighbors were using it to watch Netflix on their tablet and they apologized. These incidents kept on happening. On weekends, when I would try to work on homework or submit assignments, my internet would be super slow and I'd have to walk over and ask them to stop using it. Every single time, they'd act like they forgot they were using my Wi-Fi and they said it wouldn't happen again. A few times, I told them I was going to change my password because this was only supposed to be so their son could take his classes, not for them to watch movies or for their son to play video games online. They always swore that they wouldn't do it again but then the same thing would happen. The last straw for me was on Friday. I got home early from work because there was an assignment that needed to be submitted by 5. The assignment was mostly finished, I just needed to do some last minute edits and then submit it. 
When I got home, the stupid Wi-Fi was lagging again, and I got so angry. My time was wasted going next door, knocking for like 20 minutes because they weren't answering the door, and telling them to stop using my Wi-Fi because I had work to do. They apologized for the millionth time because they didn't realize I was home early. Anyways, my assignment was not submitted by 5, so I lost a few points. Not a lot, but I was still upset about that. That was it for me, and I changed my Wi-Fi password. Went to my neighbors and told them their son was gonna have to find another way to access his classes by Monday. They tried pleading with me because he needs the internet for his classes, but I already gave them too many chances. They came to my door on Monday after work and they asked if I had changed my mind. My neighbor said they had to drop their son off at his friend's house for his class and they said it was better for him to be at home. I told them I'm not letting them use it again since they're only gonna take advantage of it and I've already given them too many chances. His wife wasn't happy with this and she said I'm ruining her son's education before they left. Was I the jerk for that? If they had just been using my Wi-Fi for their kid's school, we wouldn't have had any problems. But they kept taking advantage and I don't know how else to make them stop. Would you let your neighbors use your Wi-Fi if they asked to? And why or why not? Please let us know. I always use my neighbor's Wi-Fi. Good thing none of them have a password set. The time I got a Karen arrested and banned from all Walmarts. Note, Walmart employees wear dark blue shirts and khaki bottoms. I was wearing a dark blue t-shirt and jean capris, but I was wearing my company lanyard ID. My last name, IT supervisor at the company. I was born with poliosis. It was spotty at first, but I'm 21 and almost all of my hair is white. And I keep my hair real short because it gets in the way way too much. I was browsing the aisles, wanting to enjoy my day off tomorrow from work at my company, and I wanted an almost spa day. I go to the lotions and I reach to grab one I believed I would like, and as soon as I touch it, a crash on the other side of the shelves causes several bottles of lotion to come crashing down on me. I was relatively fine, except for a bottle that hit my temple. Not so pain relieving after all, I chuckled to myself. Because it was how I was raised, I go over to the other side and see if everyone was alright. And everyone was. Apparently a kid took his parents cart and was running down the other side and accidentally hooked a hard left, crashing into the shelves. His parents come to check him, they say apologies and they scold him. He looked like he was about 10. I laugh it off, saying how I will survive being attacked by lotion. I say I'm OP and I tell the kid to be a bit more careful and we fist bump. They laugh and say sorry again and continue shopping. I walk back to my cart and start picking up the bottles and place them in their designated areas. I keep up on social media enough to know what's trending. I read stories like these but never thought I could live it. I'm almost finished putting the bottles back and I hear it. The unmistakable warning noise of a wild Karen. Ahem. I look over my shoulder and there she is. The biggest threat to employees and managers all over the world. She has a look on her face like someone just farted as soon as she sees me. She stomps her foot and I get images of a bull ready to charge. I brace myself. Me. Um, hello? Do you need something? Karen. It's about time you noticed me. I've been standing here forever. Now that you're done stalking that shelf, you need to help me with my list. I stand there shocked and confused. I regain myself. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't work here. There was an accident. She cuts me off. Don't you lie to me. I know you work here. You're just being lazy and don't want to. Well, too bad. You either help me or I will have you fired. She all but yells in my face. I stagger back a little. Now I'm not an outwardly confrontational person, but I will defend myself. I speak calmly. Me. No, I will not. I just told you I do not work here and I will not be helping you. I work at my company. She's having none of it. She turns red and starts yelling in my face and demands that I help her. When I go to step away again, she grabs my arm near my elbow and swings me into the lotion shelf where some bottles fall again and a broken rollback tag cuts me. In a desperate attempt to get away from her, I push her and she falls down. Karen. How dare you put your hands on me? I want your manager. Now! Before I could respond, the parents and the kid came rushing over after being a couple of aisles away and recognized my voice from earlier. At this time, Karen and I are both on the floor. She's holding her arms and I'm holding my neck. The parents instantly come to me and ask if I'm alright and send the kid to go fetch an actual employee. Not a minute later, the kid comes back with two employees. One comes to assist me and the other to Karen, who, by the way, is screaming and fake crying, saying she'll sue me and the store and demands to talk to someone in charge. 
By now, this has formed a large crowd around the area and a couple of employees are trying to clear them away. Cops have been in the area and were there. The manager and police goes over to Karen first and asks her what happened. Karen, I was going to ask for help when your employee assaulted me and tells me to buzz off. I tried to defend myself. This time, Karen is cut off by the parents. Parent one. She, Karen, is lying. We heard everything. She was demanding that OB help her with her list. Karen still demands I be fired and that she wants to press charges. The police tell the parents to be quiet and come over to me and put handcuffs on me and start reading me my rights. I begin to panic. I've never been in trouble with the law before. Karen has a smug smirk now, thinking that she's won. My saving grace is the manager. Manager to Karen. Ma'am, she doesn't work here. To the officer. Before you do that, we should review the CCTV and see what really happened. At this point, it's a little fuzzy because I started a full panic attack and it causes an asthma attack. I'm wheezing and shaking. I try to point to my bag and parent one instantly goes in and finds my inhaler. All the while, people were asking if I was okay and Karen was screaming that I was faking and should be arrested. By the time I was calm enough to be more aware of what's going on around me, parent one tells me that the police and manager looked at the footage of our aisle and confirmed Karen was the one who assaulted me first and when no one was looking, she tried to make a run for it, only to have the kid push a card at her and make her fall face first into the floor. Of course, he was scalded in front of everyone, but I know that he was rewarded later. An ambulance was called and looked me over, and they said I was okay but should see a doctor. The officer apologized and asked if I wanted to press charges. I, of course, said yes. A couple of days later, I'm back at Walmart, and I run into parent two and the kid. They tell me how after I left to the hospital that Karen was arrested and put on a ban list nationwide with her name and picture. I took her to court and she paid for my hospital visit and for emotional damage. She ended up in jail for two to three years for her previous issues. The manager also caught where I was clipped in the head from the lotion and he gave me $350 in gift cards and a card where I can get one item a month for under 50 bucks for free as an apology for everything. I said it was too much, but after the upper management saw what happened, they believed that I was too much of a valuable customer to let this slide. I think it's so I continue to use that Walmart instead of other stores in the area. I also get a week paid off from work. Who knew one Karen can do so much? Speaking of Walmart, have you ever seen a Karen in a Walmart? And if so, how did it go? Please let us know. I prefer Target. Would I be the jerk for suing my neighbor for filming me and posting it? I, 22 male, am a professional dancer. I'm visiting my parents for a few weeks and they have a small training room for me in the basement. So I was there, trained some stuff for the upcoming show, beginning when restrictions let it begin. And later that day, I scrolled through Instagram. On Instagram, I've seen that my neighbor, who's 20, filmed me and posted it onto her story. It was not a short clip. It was a whole bunch of stuff, about three minutes worth of clips. I texted her and told her to please delete the clips and she said the dancing was really good and that she would not delete it, as many of her followers, over 8,000, love it, and she offered me to put a shout out into her story. What the heck? I got a private Instagram account with 54 followers and do not care. So first of all, I don't even know her. We added on Instagram after a short chat and never talked again. I live 500 miles away. The thing is, now that I feel violated in my privacy, I mean, I have no problem with getting seen or filmed, but not at home. And for me, an even more important fact, on the video, there's some tricks and steps and effects that should not be seen until the great live reveal on stage. I'm thinking about suing her for this as I do not feel comfortable with getting my private stuff posted. Would I be the jerk? Update. I reached out to her again and told her that we will sue her. She just brushed it off, saying that the story will be gone in two hours anyways, so just forget it. I screen recorded the whole story, plus the direct messages, and reported it to Instagram, who have not done anything yet. I had a Zoom call with my crew and our manager after that. The manager told me we will sue her, as some of the routines, etc., are likely to be stolen. I don't know what to expect from that whole thing, but yeah, at least she might take a lesson from it, I guess. Our lawyers have done pretty good jobs so far. Thanks for all the answers. Bless you guys, for real. Edit after reading some of the answers. I have no evidence that she was in our garden while filming. Between the road and the window is a garden which is about 5 meters bright. She either zoomed straight into the window with a perfect angle and filmed it that way, which I doubt, or she went into the garden, which makes more sense as the quality of the recording was pretty good and stable. The window is pretty small as well. And for those wondering, I live in Austria, and as far as I know, you are not allowed to post footage online without consent of the people portrayed. If the focus is on the landscape and there are people passing by it, it's discussable. 
but she explicitly filmed me on my training session, nothing else. It really creeps me out that someone watched me this whole time and I didn't realize. I'm looking forward to returning to my city and training in my studio again. Edit 2. I will post an update in a few days. This blew up overnight and I will try to read through everything and answer open questions, so far and again. Thank you for all of your answers and ideas. I really appreciate all of you. Would you sue your neighbor if they recorded you and posted it online? Please let us know. I'll sue my neighbor for anything I can, to be honest. Customer asks me to perform thousands of dollars worth of unpaid investigative journalism to sell her a scarf. Some retail stores cater to high-touch customers more than others. The house of retail that I found myself working for most recently sells things that range from cheap, run-of-the-mill, in-house brands to Gucci and Prada and the like. It also prides itself on its customer service in a deep, unwavering, and absolute way. The customers that I had while working here definitely weren't the worst, but the retail fantasy that we offered did seem to draw in some particularly interesting people with particular quirks that definitely don't surface the same way in other stores. Something about the expectation of superlative service draws something out in them. Case in point, this woman. At this point in time, I'm often the only person in the accessories department and have taken up a sort of unpaid slash untitled manager role. She approaches me, gentle and unassuming, and holding one of the house brand scarves. She has some questions about it. I happen to love scarves, and at this point had actually dedicated a substantial amount of my personal time into educating myself on the fabrics used, specifically wool and cashmere. Really boring if you don't care, and really interesting only if you're a scarf nerd in the freezing climate. She happens to ask questions about exactly these things. It's midwinter, and the cashmere is flying off the shelves, ironically like some type of hotcake, and I'm honestly kind of overjoyed to have actual in-depth answers to offer her. At first. Very quickly, it becomes clear that she's seeking deeper knowledge, more specific knowledge. She keeps talking, veering off into her own lifelong experiences with cashmere and her own passionate morals surrounding the subject of the ethical slash sustainable harvesting of it, beginning to sound more and more like someone beating around the bush. And I think, oh no, something's happening here. Then she looks me dead in the eyes, smiles at me for the first time in our conversation and tells me that she'd be really appreciative if I did some research for her. I feel distinct unease. I tentatively give her an okay. Without a beat, she begins the list. First, she'd like to know where we as a company source our cashmere from. I inform her that this isn't common knowledge. Any information past a ply number is very rarely stated and only by very expensive brands and that I'd definitely have to contact someone much, much higher up on the chain of command to get that information. She's okay with this. This by itself is incredibly daunting. Reminder, I'm a sales clerk on commission making near minimum wage, and I'm doubting that even regional managers would have this type of knowledge. I'd have to not only cross multiple company departments blind, but magically find the exact contract within that department who deals with this type of thing. I don't even know what any behind the scenes departments are named. This is a tall order. But we're not done yet. Oh no, her hunger is deeper than a mere source location. She'd also like to know if we harvest our cashmere in an eco-friendly way. She'd like to know if we outsource it to a third-party company, and regardless of who's doing it, she'd like to know if they rotate the pastures that the goats graze in. A real issue, as the appetite of mass-bred cashmere goats can be destructive to local ecosystems. On that note, she would also like me to find out if they keep the number of goats involved low to avoid that problem. I inform her, weekly, that this would be even harder to find out. Understatement, I haven't found a single brand, $3,000 sweaters or not, that share any of this information. She's okay with this and is fine with waiting a week or two. Her generous estimation, while I do my digging on this for her. By this point, I'd started a list on paper and she gives me her email to jot down as well. Trying to be genial, I let her know that these are fantastic questions because on their own they are and that I'd love to know the answers myself, because I really would, and that I'll do my best to find out what I can. She nods sagely. Okay, great. And immediately she walks away. I stare after her, the basic look of a thank you ringing in the air, and know quietly, deep in my heart, that even if the broken promise comes back to bite me in the butt, she can do her own research. The month after is when everything started to shut down. It did not come around to bite me in the butt. What would you tell a customer if they asked you to look all this up for them? Would you do it or not? Please let us know. I don't see what the big deal is. When I schooled the school district, I'm from a medium-sized Texas town. I started school early in life and was able to skip several grades without much effort. So when I entered high school, I was much younger than my peers. 
It didn't help I was short as a starting junior high student, had a baby face with a social maturity to match. I was lucky to find an outlet in computers, practicing system security exploits, and doing things with software. While mid-90s, most people were just using their new Dell to use ICQ and Yahoo Messenger while watching Total Request live on MTV. In high school, computer classes were absolutely stifling to me, with clueless teachers trying to explain PowerPoint while they quickly tried to teach themselves. This led to me being extremely bored in class, doing things like setting up LAN games with other kids in class to pass the time, or changing grades of students, up or down, depending if they were a bully or a friend. And unfortunately, I had no friends. The teacher, after catching several students playing Doom and Quake, learned it was me bypassing their weak Windows 95 security by the guilty students throwing me under the bus. Principals were seen, parent conferences were requested, and the verdict after a long conference was I should be used to help the school handle its computer network and do free IT work. They offered to allow me to exempt from the lame elective classes and spend half my day helping brain-dead teachers figure out how to use the recycle bin and remove flying toaster screensavers. This was preferable to being in regular classes with normies who only caused me anxiety. And the fact they blackmailed me by threatening to call SPA, Software Publishers Association, when it was found out that I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing, I truly believed my hands were tied. All this BS should have been serious red flags, but again, I was young, naive, and eager to get out of trouble. Honestly, I really enjoyed the work since most days I was in a small attic that was used for storage until a teacher placed a work order and was able to do pet projects. Near the end of my junior year, I was tasked to build a database and distribute to teachers new mind-blowing fast Pentium 90 with a blistering fast 16 megs of RAM computers that were purchased during a large school renovation. This is fairly important. I took it serious with getting a barcode machine signatures of each teacher as they received the computers, etc. I was informed that the teachers were being allowed to take the computers home over summer to learn how to use them. I didn't care, they weren't mine and assumed that they were smart enough to realize I kept great records. Upon reflection now, I question if they put me in that position in hopes that I would fail. Not sure. What I am 100% sure of is out of something like 60 computers that left the school, only 14 came back. The front office acted full-blown rare about the situation. I never had any issues with teachers prior years, but once I started mentioning to the administration that I could easily let them know which teacher still had a PC, things changed. I was told to stick with minding my own business and to not make a big deal. News was spread that the school, during the renovations, purchased $100,000 worth of chalkboards just for the teachers to complain about wanting dry erase boards. So the school district wasted another $60,000 to build a warehouse to house the chalkboards versus sending the chalkboards back. There was going to be an emergency bond hearing to procure more money for the dry erase boards and they planned to tack on money to buy another round of PCs for the teachers who already stole computers for their homes. I find out the time of the school board meeting and went to it. I didn't know the rules of the meeting, so when they started talking about the need for more computers, I tried to interject but get promptly removed from the meeting and told not to return ever again. Literally the next day, I had teachers of each class misgrading my work, trumping up claims of being disruptive to get me out of class and passive-aggressive antics like forcing me to spend the entire class out of the room if I came 30 seconds late to class, causing me to not know the knowledge for tests. It became so bad, I went from making A's and B's in advanced classes to getting F's for the same efforts I was earning A's and it was seriously affecting my ability to possibly graduate. I was mad. All I did was try to do what was honest and right just to be met with strife from the school conspirators. I decided to go to a city council meeting and try to let people know what was happening, but it seemed they were warned and ready since when I went to speak, I was booted out. A little research taught me the city council and school board were working in conjunction to perform their dirty dealings. Not to be held back by a school filled with a bunch of live, laugh, love, basic jerk teachers and administrators, I noticed it was an election year and I started going to local political meet and greets with folks looking to take certain city council seats. I enjoyed when the local news cameras were there because they would usually air said questioning about the missing computers. Unbeknownst to me, several city council members up for re-election had hands in this cookie jar. I was now completely failing school because of salty teachers and the only thing saving me is threats from my parents that I would be back in the same classes with the same teachers because they were so great for OP. This actually had teachers reverse their petty grading just so they wouldn't have to deal with me again. A few weeks before the election, I spent my afternoons going door to door, reminding what property taxpayers' money is actually going to. I had entire neighborhoods ready to grab pitchforks. 
This all culminated when over half the city council, including popular incumbents, lost their seats and several investigations for misuse of funds. Several computers started magically appearing at the school from time to time from fearful teachers, but they removed the barcodes, making it completely impossible to determine whose PC it was. The idea that these people are molding the minds of the youth was terrifying to me. I barely got out of high school. My GPA was now trash and my college choices were out the window. That's a small price to pay since at the end, several people were arrested. Many lost their jobs and most who did had to flee the city since they couldn't save face. Forget them, they got theirs. Am I the jerk for not staying at work even though I was scheduled to be off for the afternoon? So with everything that's been going on, they've been low censusing people at my work, which basically means some people go home early slash arrive later in the day and they don't get paid for those missing hours. Thankfully, they take turns with low census, so it's not the same person every time. Yesterday, it was my turn to be low census for the afternoon, and I was actually looking forward to it. I had some phone calls I needed to make, and I needed to study for a huge upcoming test, so this was the perfect opportunity to work on that. However, when I got into work that morning, I saw that I had been scheduled for the whole day, despite the fact that I was supposed to be off in the afternoon. Puzzled, I asked my boss what was going on, and she explained that one of my coworkers called in sick so they needed me to stay. This bugged me because they didn't inform me of it at all. No phone call, email, or anything. I had to find out by checking the schedule the morning I came in. Here's where I might be the jerk. I explained to my boss that I had already made plans for the afternoon and couldn't stay. She got all huffy with me, and in addition to trying to guilt trip me into staying, she said we weren't allowed to make plans on low census days for that reason. In the end, I still got to go home early, but I checked my union contract because I was curious and lo and behold, it states that we aren't required to be on standby for low census days. What's more, if we are on standby, we're entitled to receiving standby pay, which is about 1.5 times our regular hourly wage. My coworkers had similarly been annoyed when I told them what our boss had said to me, so I shared this information with them and they'll be more than likely to inform our boss of this clause. Edit. Wow, you guys. I leave for a couple of hours to go to a doctor's appointment only to come back to a flooded inbox. I'd like to thank everyone who commented and offered judgment and support. I'm very tender-hearted and I don't like it when people are mad at me so it gives me comfort in knowing that I didn't do anything wrong. I actually have a meeting with my management tomorrow that's for a completely different crap show of a story. To be brief, basically management tried to write me up for failure to improve on feedback but they completely botched the process and didn't follow the proper protocol at all. So HR threw it out. I don't doubt for a second that they might try to start the process again tomorrow and I wouldn't be shocked if this came up during the meeting. If it does, I'll just mention the union clause and leave it at that. I consulted with my father on what to do tomorrow and he advised me to go in with a level head and if they start talking like they want to pursue punishment, shut it down immediately by requesting a union representative. Legally, once a union representative has been requested, management can't continue with the meeting. He also advised me that if I do and they continue with the meeting in spite of it, don't say anything. Let them dig their own grave and the second I get out of there, contact high management and tell her what happened and possibly even my union depending on how things go. This woman not only actually knows my dad and is on relatively friendly terms with him, but in simple terms, she's also basically the boss of my supervisor and my administrator and she's essentially in charge of how the whole facility is run and determines whether or not we get to stay open during what's going on. Not the kind of person you want to have mad at you. She's very fair and kind and she's actually the one I contacted when they tried to write me up and she investigated everything on my behalf and was the one to tell management that they couldn't do this. Because of this, she's already ticked at my supervisor and my administrator for how they handled things and the poor girl will probably have an aneurysm if they pull something like this tomorrow, especially since she already talked to my supervisor about how she handled things. With all of this in mind now, I'm actually kind of excited to see how this meeting will go tomorrow because if management messes up again, it will not go well for them. I'll update this post again tomorrow when I get home from work with how everything went. Edit 2. Who's out here giving me awards on my stupid post about my workplace gripes? Seriously, y'all are too kind. $7 for a sandwich? I want to see a manager. It finally happened. I witnessed my first Karen. Boyfriend and I went to the local mini market to get some pizza dough. Thankfully, there's not much of a line, so we get on and wait our turn. Suddenly, we see slash hear this lady, henceforth known as Karen. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the haircut. Go off on this poor cashier girl complaining about the sandwich from the deli. I'm guessing she didn't know the price until it was rung up, because suddenly we hear, $7? Are you kidding? 
My boyfriend and I look at each other like, oh god, Karen, I want to see a manager. This is ridiculous. The cashier goes and comes back with a manager within two seconds. It's a small store. I gotta give credit, this guy doesn't back down. Karen is complaining about the price of the sandwich and manager is explaining that the weight of the meat in the sandwich equals the price. She is not having it. Karen, I can get it for much cheaper at the deli down the street. In my head, I'm like, then why are you here? Karen, I'm still gonna buy it, but just look at it. This isn't much meat. Manager, I'm sorry you don't like our prices, but that's how much it is with the weight of the meat, cheese, and spread. Karen, but that's far too high. Let me show you the sandwich. Manager, miss, if you open the container, you have to buy it. I'll still pay for it, but I'm never coming here again. Lady proceeds to open the container and show him the contents of the sandwich. Manager, there's plenty of meat and cheese. Karen, but not worth $7. Manager, I don't make the prices. I'm sorry, miss. Manager rolls his eyes and leaves. This lady is now berating this cashier who has nothing to do with the pricing. My first job when I was 17 was as a cashier for a supermarket, so I immediately empathized with the girl. There's so much you want to say, but can't, because you have to keep that customer service smile in order to get that paycheck. The other cashier calls for me and boyfriend to ring us up. Then I hear this ridiculousness. Karen, what's happened to the people who used to own this place? They never would have priced it like this. Cashier, I'm not sure. I was hired after new ownership took over. Even so, they no longer own this store. Karen, I'm going to make a complaint. This is ridiculous. Seven dollars for a tiny sandwich? Okay, so I've been to this store many, many times. The sandwiches aren't big, but there's a decent amount of meat in there, and it depends on what kind of sandwich you get. At this point, I've had enough, and so has boyfriend. We don't want to make a scene, and I'm not very good with confrontation. Boyfriend and I leave. The exit is right where Karen and the cashier are. We get to exit, and just before we leave, I shout, Bye, Karen! Karen turns her head to look at me with bewildered eyes. I walk off. Boyfriend looks at this lady with an annoyed slash disapproving look. It may have been a bit cowardly, but I'm still kind of proud of it. Especially when I heard one of the cashiers let out a laugh. Boyfriend and I laugh all the way back to the car. I don't know what happened after we left, but from the look at that lady's face, I think she realized just how she looked. Not very dramatic, no cops, no rants, just an entitled lady complaining about a sandwich. Oh, and boyfriend and I made an awesome pizza. Speaking of sandwiches, where's your favorite place to get sandwiches from? I used to go to this place called Schlotzky's back in the day. They were really good. I prefer Panera Bread. My Jason's Deli is a close second. Karen the counselor gets me in trouble for reading a book. When I was a kid, I went to camp over the summers, but they were never camps I enjoyed. I went to at least four or five different camps and I had problems with all of them. I wasn't a troubled kid or anything, but the other kids would bully me nonstop for being the weird kid. But I don't want to get into all of that, it triggers me. There was a camp that was for girls only. Being one who loves nature and all things outdoorsy, I thought I could go to the camp and make some real friends. Didn't happen. I was there for a few weeks and the days got steadily worse. I wasn't allowed to go hiking, weird right? And I wasn't allowed in the pool without being cleared to go swimming. I've never been a good swimmer, so the pool didn't interest me anyway. I wasn't allowed to go canoeing in the lake either because I needed a boating buddy and no one wanted to associate with the weird girl. So all in all, the camp sucked. The camp was a day camp, so my parents picked me up after work and brought me home. But over dinner, I'd always be crying and begging my parents to pull me out of there. I know my parents didn't like sending me to that camp, but I was of the young age where I couldn't be on my own for 8 hours of the day. So that camp was the best option at the time. Anyway, on to the story. Sorry for all the backstory. I had to explain all of this. One day at camp, I was sitting by myself and reading a book when one of the counselors, one of the many Karens here, came up to me. She asked me why I was reading and when I said, I like reading, she said there's more to life than books. I told her that I know that, but reading is happiness to me. Counselor Karen told me that it was my turn to choose an activity for all the girls in our group. I politely told her to give the choice to someone else because all I wanted to do was to be left alone with my book. In my defense, it was a really good book. Counselor Karen told me I had to choose because it was part of the camp rules. I said again that I didn't want to play a game, 
But in a choice between reading or hanging out with mean girls, I would choose the books every single time. How mean of you to say! I remember Counselor Karen screeching. She ripped my book out of my hands and said that I had a choice between hanging out at the camp or reporting to the head counselor for punishment. I asked what that punishment was, and when Counselor Karen told me I'd have to leave the camp, I smiled and said, Thank you. She marched me right to the main office and told the head counselor I was being difficult for her and it wasn't appreciated. The head counselor gave me a lecture on being social and that being antisocial is not approved of at the camp. I got sarcastic and said that I guess she had to send me home early, that not coming back to the camp would be their punishment and my reward. The head counselor called my mom and dad and said I was being difficult to handle and mean to other people. I didn't get a chance to defend myself and explain myself to my parents, but as I was in the room during the phone call, my parents called the head counselor out on their BS and promised me I'd never have to go back. I felt a wave of relief that my parents believed me over what the counselors at the camp were saying and felt overjoyed that I never had to go back there again. What was funniest about the whole situation, I think, was that I had to wait in the head counselor's office until my parents picked me up. So I spent that short time reading my book in peace. Counselor Karen came into the office to check up on me and make sure I was behaving myself and was totally fuming that I was reading and not hanging out with the other girls at the camp. After I left that day, permanently, my parents congratulated me on how calm I was about the whole situation and for the rest of that summer, I was able to stay home and read to my heart's content. And on the weekends, my dad would take me hiking and my mom would take me to the bookstore. That summer was awesome, but then I had to go to another camp summers later. And those stories will be saved for another day. To this day, I'm still surprised how I got in trouble for reading a book. How is reading a book a bad thing? Speaking of reading, do any of you like to read? And if so, what do you like to read? Please let us know. I prefer listening. So let's get on with the next story, Reddit boy. Am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend she's no longer welcome at my house? I, 30 male, live with my best buddy Mark, who's also 30. We decided two years ago we were sick of paying high rent costs and having bad roommates, so we pooled our money together to put a deposit down on a house. It's a good arrangement, as we both have our own separate spaces. It's cheaper paying a mortgage, as we do everything jointly. We've also been best friends for over 20 years and enjoy living together. It's also important to note that I'm straight and Mark is not, but this has never bothered me and it doesn't impact how I see him. Mark is single after a breakup right now, and I've been seeing Hannah, was seeing her, for about a year. I told her right from the start about my living arrangements, so in case she ever came to my house, she knew Mark lived there too. It never seemed to be an issue until Mark and his boyfriend broke up and Hannah's attitude changed. She started making comments saying that she was uncomfortable with him around me and that he was making eyes at me a lot. I told her she was being ridiculous, so did Mark and we both laughed at the idea of being into each other. We're complete opposites and are more like brothers and it weirds us out that Hannah is making comments. I've told Hannah multiple times to stop as this is Mark's house too and I won't have him feeling crappy. Hannah just keeps ramping it up and her comments are getting worse to a point she even said he wanted to make a move on me. I finally snapped. I told her that just because he likes guys doesn't automatically mean that he wants to get with me and her attitude is disgusting. She said she was joking and I said it didn't feel like a joke. I told her, if you seriously can't change your attitude and treat Mark like a person, then you're not welcome here anymore. You're 30. Act like it. Get out. Hannah has been calling me a jerk for treating her like a child and some of her friends have messaged me saying I'm being too harsh. I'm asking for judgment as I may be the jerk for being too firm and not trying to talk to her about why she is speaking about Mark this way instead of downright refusing to let her be near him. Update. I have come to the conclusion Hannah and I are no more. Thank you for your comments. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I think Hannah might be a little insecure to be honest. This playground is for my kid only. I was on the swings at my country club with my sister one day, just talking and having a good time. I was seven and my sister was around six. So anyway, here's the cast. We've got Entitled Mom, Entitled Kid, we've got my mom, my sister, the country club employee, and me. Entitled mom and entitled kid walk up. Entitled mom. My angel says you won't let him on the swings. Is this true? Me, scared. No. Remember, I'm seven, and I'm not used to having angry Karens coming out of nowhere and yelling at me. Entitled mom. How dare you call my angel a liar? 
He told me so, and he never lies. Me, still scared, almost shaking. I I'm sorry, but I didn't say he couldn't go on the swings, entitled mom. Where is your mother? I need to tell her how rude you were to me and my son. This was the oldest trick in the book. I pointed at the nearest lady and said, her, as fast as possible, and booked it for my real mom. My mom, seeing us running over. What happened? Me and my sister. Some lady started yelling at us for no reason. My sister didn't talk during the initial Karen attack because she was on the verge of tears. Remember, I was seven and she was six. My mom, where is she? I need to go talk to her. Me, over there, I point. My mom walks over to Entitled Mom, who's now in a lawn chair. Hey, were my kids being disrespectful to you? Entitled Mom, yes, they were not letting my kid go on the swings. Mom, oh, I'm sorry, but I saw what happened and I did not see your kid say anything to mine. And they don't say he did either. Are you calling my son a liar? How dare you? Entitled Kid starts running in the background. I take notice and realize what he's doing. He's running directly towards the swings. Me, being the petty little seven-year-old that I was, took off running trying to save our swings. My sister soon realized too and started running. We beat him there by a second and he jumped right on my swing anyway with me on it. I pushed him off and the following ensues. Entitled Kid jumps up to the tower next to the swings with a handful of wood chips from the floor off the ground. He throws them at my sister and I. Entitled Mom then comes running over with my mom close behind. Entitled Mom. You hurt my baby, you little... My mom. They're just kids. Watch your mouth. Yes, my mom was that kind of parent. Entitled Mom. Well, they hurt him, and I will not stand by while you let your kids make all of their own decisions on their own. They are rude and hurtful and should have never been allowed to come here. Keep in mind that this is a members only club and you need a friend to be there already to sponsor you, so it's hard to get into. Entitled Mom grabs my arm and throws me off the swings nearly to the ground. Employee has seen the whole thing. Ma'am, I'm going to need to ask you to leave this family alone or you will be asked to leave. Your kid threw wood chips all over these kids here and they did nothing wrong. It was them, pointing at us. They were going to attack us. They pushed my baby off the swings and they were going to attack me. Employee. Ma'am, I'm going to need to ask you to leave. No, it was those little monsters. Now. Entitled mom grabs her kids and leaves. Finally. Sorry I don't know where a specific item is. Go ahead, call the manager. Earlier this year, I was in my local grocery store. I had just got off work, so I was wearing a white dress shirt, dress pants, and a tie. Here I am, minding my own business, looking for taco mix, when a woman who's about 30 comes up to me. The lady asks me what aisle pancake mix is in, so I told her, I think it's in aisle 5. Lady walks away, no thank you, no nothing. About 5 minutes later, I'm getting something from the top shelf for my wife, who's standing next to me, when the lady comes up to me again, looking annoyed. This time she goes, it wasn't in aisle 5, I went down there and it wasn't there. I ended up finding it in aisle 6. I responded, sorry? Meanwhile, my wife is looking super confused. The lady goes on to ask if there was a washroom she could use. I tell her, sorry, I don't think the bathroom is for public use. But she interrupts me, I have to use the washroom. This is ridiculous. You won't even let paying customers use the washroom? I demand to speak to your manager immediately. At this point, I am now annoyed. My response, Sure, but honestly, I don't think she'll care what you have to say about the store's washroom policy. By this time, the lady's husband and the store manager have walked up. Lady raises her voice. You jerk! I demand to speak to the manager, now! Her husband, looking horrified, quickly interjects. Honey, he doesn't work here. I look her dead in the eye. Yeah, I totally don't work here. I was trying to be helpful. Do you still want me to call the manager? Her husband answered, No, it's fine. Sorry. As I'm walking away, I hear the lady say to the store manager, He has a serious attitude problem. You are just going to let him talk to customers like that? To which he responded, Sorry ma'am, he's not an employee. He does not work here. He is another shopper. As we're walking to the checkout lane, my wife goes, Why do people always think you work in the stores when we go shopping? The next day at work for good measure, I informed my manager that I had a customer complaint about my attitude and for not knowing what aisle pancake mix was on at the grocery store. She laughed. Am I the jerk for telling my partner to tone down their attitude and show me some respect and gratitude? Before having our kid, eight weeks old, we agreed that I would be the working parent 
and my partner would stay home. We made this decision for various reasons, but we were 100% in agreement before trying to conceive. I'm now back at work, 50% at home and 50% in the office. I work 10 hour days, plus three hours of total commuting on the days I'm in the office. In the morning, I wake up, get myself ready, change the baby, dress the baby, feed the baby. I will try and get the baby to go back to sleep before starting work, but this doesn't always happen. When I work from home, I will take the baby during the day when I'm able to keep an eye on her and work simultaneously. After work, I look after the baby for one to two hours so my partner can have some time to themselves. Then we do bath time together and I give the baby her final bottle and put her to bed after which I also sleep. During the week, partner does all the night wakings and on the weekend I handle them. I do all the house admin, I buy all the groceries and do a majority of the cooking. Laundry and dishes are split evenly. My partner handles all of the other cleaning. To provide some additional context, partner recently convinced me to lend $300 to brother-in-law who hasn't paid it back, and knowing him, he most likely won't. It won't bankrupt us, but we really could have used that money this month. I guess it had been a tough night last night. I slept in a separate room to get some solid sleep because my partner was snappy with me, saying something like, just come take her and get out, when I went to get the baby. So I took kiddo, did our usual routine, and then started work from home. My day started with a call during which I put kiddo back in my partner's room, and once again I got snapped at. Isn't it your job to put her back to sleep before bringing her in here? I couldn't, the baby didn't want to sleep. After my first call, I had no more planned for a couple of hours, so I took kiddo back. At around 10 a.m., I had more calls planned, so I took the baby to my partner and promised that I would come back later in the afternoon so they could take a longer nap if they wanted. I then went to make a bottle to save my partner having to get out of bed. As I passed the bottle to my partner to feed baby, I got a, what the heck took you so long? So I eventually snapped and said, I get it, you're tired, but this is what you signed up for when you agreed to be a stay-at-home parent. Am I not working my butt off to provide for this family and to make up for the money which you wanted to give your brother? So tone down your attitude and show me some respect and gratitude. I didn't yell, but I was very stern. I also stormed out of the room and since then have just been working. Was I the jerk to respond this way? ETA. My partner has not said anything to me since the incident and is quite clearly angry about my outburst, so I'm concerned I overstepped with my comments. Edit 2. I realize I didn't include the genders, but I am the mother in this situation. Partner is baby's dad. Do you know where the instant potatoes are? For context, I was in my local Wegmans supermarket, best grocery stores ever, and the uniform is khakis and some bright colored polo with logos and name tags. I'm wearing light blue shorts, an electric blue shirt, and a fanny pack across my chest. Kinda didn't look like an employee at all. Anywho, more context. I'm using their in-store scan app for faster checkout and it makes my phone bleep loudly. So I could understand, navigating through mask life by sound, I might resemble an employee or at least Instacart shopper. I'm in the Asian cuisine aisle looking for rice. An older lady with a post-it note in her hand and no smartphone to be seen. Hey, excuse me. I'm in here shopping for a friend and she wants instant potatoes and I've never bought them and have no idea where to look for them. Can you help me figure out where they are? Me, already on my phone in their lookup app looking for the specific rice my fiance wanted. Um, I know they're nearby. Hang on, let me check. Search and find. Yeah, they're over in aisle 21B, just a couple over from here. As I said this, I turned and she saw the logo on my shirt that's clearly 30-something never grew up and decidedly not employed. Lady. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I thought you worked here. You're so kind to help me anyway, even though you didn't have to. Me. Yeah, well, I had my phone out and the app open anyway. Figured might as well save you from trying to chase down an employee. Lady. Look at you getting some good karma in. Thanks! And wanders off to go grab her friend the instant potatoes. Edit. After seeing more than three queries as to what instant potatoes are, presumably by non-Americans, instant potatoes are basically potatoes that get cooked, then dehydrated, then ground or shredded down into flakes, put in a box, shipped to a store, or you. Who would Amazon this though? And then you boil water and throw some of the flaky powder into the boiling water, adding butter to make them more palatable. They resemble the color and consistency of laundry soap powder. It's a purely American innovation from back when American lifestyles precluded having enough time to peel, boil, strain, and then mash potatoes by hand. Speaking of potatoes, do you like potatoes or not? Please let us know. Loaded baked potatoes for the win! Yes! I'm the owner. 
He is my son. Quick intro. This was a funny story that happened to me a few years ago. My parents are the founders of a resort and a chairman of the board of directors. I have sat in a few of the meetings so everyone knows that I'm the boss's son. I got homeschooled so the majority of my friends are basically senior staffs and people in the board. Pretty sad, huh? Cast. We've got me, Noah. I look a lot younger than my age and being 5'7 doesn't help. We've got my dad and mom. We've got my fiance, Julia. My sister, Emma. Manager, Jack. And the crazy lady, Karen. I was on vacation with my fiance, Julia, and my sister, Emma. I, Julia, and Emma were staying at my dad's resort for a week or two because we were visiting my mother. As we entered the resort, I noticed the parking lot was packed. It was midsummer and saw a few cars roaming around looking for parking spots. My family has a few private parking spots and I noticed that his car wasn't here but my mother's car was. As I walked over to the reception, most of the staff know who I am, one of the staff working saw me and walked over to greet me. There were quite a few people in line waiting to check in. Ma'am, your mom is currently in a meeting. Would you like me to bring your luggage to your room? Yeah, thanks. Julia kept the bag that had our swimming clothes in it. Sometime later. After a bit of swimming, we went to the restaurant to eat lunch. I had put on a blue shirt and was still in my gray swimming trunks. The clothing looked similar to the uniform that the waiters were wearing. They were almost identical, except the only difference was that I didn't have the word staff on it. This will come in handy later. While we were chatting in the restaurant, I heard some lady say, Hey, you! rather rudely from somewhere behind me. I first thought it was just someone trying to get the attention of a waiter, so I continued chatting, eating with Julie and Emma. As I was chugging down some ginger ale after regretting trying my sister-in-law's food, which she purposely did not tell me was pretty spicy, she knows I don't handle spicy food well and probably never will. Can anyone else relate? Someone suddenly roughly grabbed my shoulder from behind me and I almost choked on my soda, spitting it all over my sister. Straight up karma, I gotta say. Ew, gross, was Emma's response, while my fiancé stood straight up and was about to ask me if I was alright. But here comes, you know who, Karen, interrupting my sweet fiancé. Babe, are you- Hey, I've been trying to get your attention for a while now, Karen yelled out. Me being someone who doesn't get mad that easily looked up and asked her politely, Do you need anything, ma'am? Why are you eating with the guests and not doing your stupid job, Karen said. I caught on pretty quickly and knew that she thought I was staff from what I was wearing, but I was getting a little annoyed from how much she was yelling at me while she was a foot away from me. Ma'am, I don't work, I tried saying. Shut up! I am a VIP here! Karen continued yelling. I continued to talk calmly to Miss Loudmouth while raising my voice a bit. Excuse me! I don't work here! Slap! Don't you use that tone with me, brat! As she slapped me, her long nails cut into my cheek. My sister immediately started to call our mother to come. The manager was walking over when he heard Karen yelling, but then broke into a run and hurried over when he saw Karen slap. Ma'am? Noah? You alright? Jack had said. Jack was someone who had worked for the resort for a few years, so he was pretty casual with me. My fiancé had put a piece of napkin on my cheek to stop the bleeding. Are you the manager? I want this staff fired. He is unprofessional. I don't know why you hired an idiot. Karen pointed at me and spoke as if she was the owner. Ma'am, he doesn't work here, Jack started explaining. You're trying to cover him? I want you fired as well. I never knew someone's face could get as red as a tomato until that day. I saw my mother running over with two security guards, and when she saw my fiancé holding the napkin against my face and Karen yelling at me, I thought she was going to explode as she rushed over to me. My sister had informed our mother about what had happened and what Karen was doing. My mother almost yelled, What on earth happened? Guards, arrest her! What do you mean, arrest me? Who are you to do that? Karen was struggling in the guards' hands. I am the owner. You dare to slap my son? My God, the face Karen made when she heard those lines. I won't ever forget it. She was as white as snow while her eyes and mouth were wide open. After she was taken away, some of the other customers started clapping. My mother ran up to me to see my face. She spoiled me when I was younger and was always defensive of me as if she was a mother protecting her cub. She was the one who had me do homeschooling after she was told I was getting bullied in primary and middle school. After we had taken care of the cut on my face, which I ended up needing stitches for, no worries, the scar faded. My mother told me that Karen had been charged and would be spending the following month in jail. Can I get up? Wait a minute. This won't be long, but I hope you enjoy. But first, understand this. I live in North Carolina, and there's a lot of commercial area. 
I'm talking gas station next to gas station next to gas station. The amount of businesses smashed so close together is amazing. Now to the story. At the time, I'm 14, and like any other 14-year-old, they get sucky retail or fast food jobs. I was working at a McDonald's that leads to a highway, so there's a lot of passing traffic. Across is a grocery store and a gas station. It was an all-in-one traffic-packed two-lane road. You could get gas, walk over for a burger, then head to the store for ice cream. It was awesome. One day during my lunch, I decided to head to the grocery store across the road and grab a bottle of water and a burrito. While I was searching for that holy burrito, I heard the worst thing you could hear in a grocery store, a throat clearing. I thought to myself some poor employee was about to be harassed. Then I heard it again. I turned around. Me. Yes? Karen. Where are all the tomatoes? They're over there, I pointed. Good. Go fetch some for me. Um, what? Now, I'm wearing a red shirt, black jeans, and a vest with the McDonald's logo. You heard me. Give me some tomatoes. You do work here after all. Uh, no I don't. And even if I did, I doubt anyone would bring you your precious tomatoes. She started to track down a manager. I found and paid for my items and went back across the street. And you will never guess what happened next. Well, it is a Karen. You probably do. I was on the drive through and not even five minutes later, I heard that same voice. Me. Hello, welcome to McDonald's. How can I help you? I said in a joyful manner, hoping she would catch on. Nope. Karen. Can I get this burger? Me. Here's the price. Pull to the first window. Karen looks at me. Surprised Pikachu face. But you work over... Me. Here's the price, please. She hands me the cash and goes to the next window. I rush to the next window because I could not let this opportunity pass. I tell the dude at the other window to let me do this. By now I have a crowd. Me. I smirk. Here you go. Have a nice day. She's annoyed and spins her tires out of the lot. Funny part is, she forgot her burger and never came back for it. Speaking of McDonald's, McDonald's or Wendy's? Please let us know. Have you ever dipped Wendy's fries in a Frosty? <clears throat> yes. Man can't spell his own name. I own a small screen printing and embroidery shop, and part of our services are setting up online pop-up stores for schools and organizations to order their merch and for fundraising. It's pretty cool software, and I can customize lots of things. I have a disclaimer in three different places, one of which you have to click to close before you can submit your order. It says this, please take a moment to double check sizes, colors, quantities, and any personalization on your order. We only offer refunds after goods have been printed in case of manufacturer defect, not user error. If you need to alter or cancel your order before it is printed, please call us at this number or email us here. This is important info for the conversation below. For context, we've got me and we've got crazy man. Me. Thank you for calling our shop. How can I help you? Customer. Yeah. I just got my order for our team store, and a name is misspelled on the back of my hoodie. Me. I'm sorry about that, sir. If you could give me your order number, I can look up your order and see what happened. He gives me the order number. I look up the order and see the hoodie in question. Me. I see here the hoodie in question. Could you please tell me the correct spelling? D-U-S-S-E-L-D-O-R-F. Not real name, but it's a good example. Me. Well, I see on your order that you entered D-U-S-E-L-D-O-R-F, so that is what was printed. Yeah, I know. You spelled it wrong. Me. Sir, that is the information you had to key in when you placed your order. I did not type that. You did. I cannot change or add anything to an order on my end except for refunds. So how does the refund work? Do you send another one or something? Me. No, sir. We will not be issuing a replacement or refund as we fulfilled the order as it was placed. We only give refunds in case of manufacturer defect. Well, it was defective. The name was spelled wrong. I think I know how to spell my own name. It doesn't matter if I typed it wrong in that one place. The name is all over the receipt. How did you not check there? This is your fault, and I want it replaced. Me. Sir, our software pulls all the personalizations into a spreadsheet, and all we see is style number, color, size, and personalization options. It does not show order numbers or who the items belong to. We match them up with receipts and packaging after personalization has been done. We do not have time to cross-reference every personalization with every invoice before decorating. That's why we put the disclaimer to double-check your order before submitting it. So you're telling me that all I can do now is try to peel this name off or just lose the money? Me. Yes. Well, I won't be doing business with you ever again. Your customer service is terrible. Me. Thank you and have a great day. The funny thing is, the ball team this store is for has a contract with us, so
so everyone on the team has to order from us. I hope he has luck trying to get one of the other parents to order anything else for him because he's never doing business with us again. But they're the same brand. So for far too long, I worked retail, and for most of it, I sold electronics. Back then, electronics in a brick and mortar store was much more competitive than it is now. Price matching was serious business, and a lot of people shopped around for the best possible prices, even if that discount cost them more in gas than driving around store to store. Our price match policy was better than most, if a bit more strict about the requirements, because we gave an extra 10% of the difference off the purchase. Honestly, the same TV was the same price just about everywhere, and the biggest price difference was usually around $50 for a $1,000 TV. If there was a significant difference, it was because they were different TVs. Enter our customer. She and her friend had an ad from Wally World down the street. Not sure if it's changed in recent years, but they never carried the higher-end TVs. Being who they are, they usually stuck to carrying bargain TVs and their high-end stuff was mid-range for most other stores, something I and all my coworkers in the department knew. The customer didn't ask for any help until she was ready to buy. She looked at each TV on our wall one by one and compared each picture of a certain brand. Finally, she called for help and I answered the call. She had decided on a pretty decent TV. Pretty sure it was the one I always recommended as best bang for your buck if you wanted something of real quality but didn't need to spend an ungodly amount to have the latest and greatest. I checked stock and gave her the total, and that was when she pulled out their ad with such a happy and smug look on her face and proclaimed that she was price matching for a few hundred dollars less than what we had it. In my head, I already knew she was wrong. There was never such a big difference on the same TV. There just wasn't enough margin in electronics for such a thing. I ask for the ad and immediately see it's a different TV. It was a lower resolution and even lacked smart features for streaming, which was still relatively new back then on TVs. I informed her that this is not the same TV. Her, but it's the same brand. Me, but it's a different model. But it's the same size. But worse features. But they're both this brand. She couldn't get it. Her friend wasn't any help. Finally, I tried my go-to comparison when people just didn't get technology. Cars. People usually understand the basics of cars, even if they don't get the basics of built-in Wi-Fi on TVs or screen resolution. Me. Would you expect a Focus or a Mustang to cost the same, just because they are both Ford? Her friend got it. The customer buying the TV thought it was complete and exceptionally stinky BS. She refused to believe the same brand TV could come in different priced versions. I was kind of dumbfounded by it all. In the end, her friend convinced her to go buy the other one. We had the TV in the ad, but frankly, it wasn't worth dealing with her. I was happy to see them go and thankful her friend was there, or else the customer would have probably fought with management over it. Karen demands I buy her plane tickets. I married my wife at least 12 years ago. She has a 16-year-old daughter, Anna, from her previous relationship, and we have a 7-year-old son as well. From pretty much the beginning of our relationship, Anna and I have never gotten along. I don't know how to emphasize that it is not because of a lack of trying. She just does not like me. When she was young, she was just scared of me and afraid I'd tear their family apart. Nowadays, it's more of a neutral dislike rather than strong antipathy, so I suppose that's progress. Elise is a stay-at-home mother, so she relies on me for income. As a result, I pay for everything for Anna. Food, clothes, volleyball fees, field trips. I take an interest in her hobbies. I go to her games. I'm not saying I'm perfect but I try my hardest to be the best stepfather I can be. But it's so hard. Always giving me curt one word responses. Always having to have an attitude. She just does things to get a rise out of me. Staying out late, reeking of booze, always trying to sneak boys in, typical rebellious stuff. But I always let her know I love her and I'm there for her in hopes of her craphead teenager phase passing. The opposite is true for her biological father. She adores him. Can't tell you why. He never goes to her games always makes excuses for why he doesn't want to see her. He forgot her birthday last month and she cried herself to sleep. Well, anyways. Friday, I came to her room to check her phone and read her messages. Not a permanent thing, but she's been caught sneaking out twice in the last month, so this is our punishment. I ask for the phone. She says, No, I'm tired of you checking my crap. Leave me alone. I tell her I'm not asking again, and she just goes, Just buzz off already. You're not my real dad. You never have been. Stop acting like you can tell me what to do before getting up and slamming the door. Like I said, guys, I'm tired. Tired of the blatant disrespect, of being the verbal punching bag while still providing more for her than anyone else in her family. We haven't really talked since until this morning during breakfast. 
She asked me if I could pay for her plane tickets so she could go see her boyfriend cross state. Like I said, her mom doesn't work and her dad is a jerk, so I normally would be the one to cough up the money. Not this time. I responded, go ask your real dad. I could tell that she was hurt. Tears swelled up from her face and she excused herself from the table. My wife took me aside later and said my comment was extremely disrespectful. I said if anything's disrespectful, it's her treating me like a doormat and a credit card, and I will no longer tolerate this treatment in my house. I told her we don't have to be friends, but if she can at least be cordial to me or respect my position as an authority figure, she can find someone else to pay for her non-essentials. Am I the jerk? Edit. And to add more context, my wife is a saint. She does stick up for me when Anna says something rude or snarky. She just said stooping to her level was inappropriate. But she's a wonderful mom and tries her best. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for saying that to Anna? Or did he have every right to? Please let us know. Anna reminds me of myself when I was younger. Entitled mom thinks her kids shouldn't have to pick up after their dog. My significant other and I were renting a ground floor unit at a really nice apartment complex. I wouldn't say it was a luxury apartment or anything, but our ground floor unit had a little patio off the back that led out into a really nice courtyard area with hammocks, a walking path, outdoor fireplace, seating, etc. A lot of people walk their dogs out there or let their kids play out in the grass, including us. We have a one-year-old cane corso. We got her when we'd been living in the unit for about two and a half months and she was only eight weeks at the time. She's a really good dog and we trained her well. We could let her out to go potty and she'd come right back, even if there were distractions, people, and other dogs out. We always stood on the patio and watched her anyways, because our pet agreement said we couldn't leave our dog unattended. Then we'd go pick up her poop right away, also part of the pet agreement, as I'm sure it's standard at most apartment complexes. We kept a small step trash can outside specifically for her doggy bags, because we didn't want to throw them away inside and only outside trash cans were on the other side of the building, which I agree is super dumb. It really was a small trash can, like the kind you'd tuck into the bathroom between the toilet and the wall. We also had our little bags hanging on our patio door handle for easy access so we didn't have to hunt for them every time we needed them. Entitled mom and her entitled kid moved in on the ground floor in our building, two units down from us. No biggie. We ran into her one day carrying our groceries and my significant other held open the door for her. She seemed kind of Karenish, but was polite and her kid, who was probably around 10 or 11, didn't look up from his phone. Whatever, that's pretty typical of kids these days. They also had a dog, a little black and white fluffy thing, super cute, but not trained very well. Don't know what kind of dog, but it was much smaller than our already giant puppy. After about two weeks or so, we realized that there was dog poo in the grass right off of our patio. We found out the hard way because my boyfriend stepped in it the first time. Luckily, he wasn't barefoot. It was clearly not from our dog, as one, we always picked up her poo right after she went, and two, they were very obviously from a small dog, not our 70-pound puppy. We'd been in the apartment about seven to eight months at that point and had never had an issue with this, so we figured it was Entitled Mom's little dog. I wrote her a polite note that basically was like, Hey neighbor, we noticed that some of your dog's doo-doo aren't being picked up and are right off of our patio. Per the pet agreement we all have to sign, we all need to be picking up after our dogs each time they go. I'm sure it was an accident and you just didn't notice, so if you could make sure to do that going forward, we'd appreciate it. Your neighbor in unit number blank. She wasn't home, so I slipped it under the door and went back to my apartment. A couple hours later, Entitled Bomb is banging on my door and gets really angry with me, insists that it couldn't have been her dog and how dare I assume. I felt really bad and I apologized immediately said I didn't mean to offend her and it must have been from someone else. She told me never to bother her with crap like this again and stormed off. I was like, okay. Not three days later, I was sitting on my patio with a book enjoying the cool weather when I see their little dog run out of their back door. No one with it and it comes over to me. I said hello to the pup because I love pups and then it went to the bathroom right off my patio, ran back home and scratched the door to be let in. I saw Entitled Kid slide the door open enough to let the dog in and then he closed it again without coming outside to pick up after the dog. I was annoyed because here I saw it with my own eyes that it was their dog and no one was even watching it when it went outside. So I grabbed the bag, picked it up, wrote another less polite note about Entitled Mom's kid neglecting to watch the dog or coming to pick up after it and dropped the bag and the note on their patio right by the door, then went back to my reading. 
Entitled Mom was quicker to come by this time and stomped right up to me, waving the note around, then stated that her kid was just a kid and probably just forgot to check. I said I didn't care. Her kid was old enough to stand outside for three minutes and come pick up the dog's mess. She said, well, there's no bags or trash cans on this side of the building and she didn't feel comfortable making her kid walk all the way around the building for that. The next part is my own fault, in hindsight. I suggested she put a trash can like mine on her patio and leave their own bags handy like we do for our dog. She eyed our stuff, huffed some more, rolled her eyes, refused to do anything about it and walked off. At this point, I was super annoyed. I stalked my patio door for the next couple of days as much as I could, just waiting. And sure enough, on day two in the evening when I was about to give up, I see the puppy run outside towards my patio. I whipped out my phone, took some pictures of the dog outside alone, not allowed, and the dog going to the bathroom, and then took another photo an hour later of the mess still there, and timestamped all of them. Then I sent an email to the apartment office people who were always pretty nice, and they responded quickly that they would give Entitled Mom a warning about it. And sure enough, Entitled Mom comes back again to get mad and yell at me about how petty I was to report them to the office and now they had a $150 fine for not picking up their dog's mess. It's worth noting that these fines were rare. In order for the office to find someone for dog poo, they had to have proof that it was that specific tenant's dog and that it wasn't picked up. Hence the photos I'd taken and timestamped. I told her that I had tried to be nice about it with her twice before and it was her own fault at that point for not abiding by the terms of the pet agreement we all had to sign everybody who had a dog at least. She went off about how she's a single mom and she works during the day and her precious baby can't be expected to pick up after their dog. I told her that a 10 slash 11 year old was plenty old enough to pick up after a dog and that if they weren't responsible enough, then maybe the kid shouldn't be letting the dog out at all and she should be the one to do it and maybe whoever is home with him should be looking after it. She got angry, told me I had no idea how to be a single mom that her mom stays with him during the day and shouldn't be expected to look after her kid and her dog and she stomped off again. I expected to hear some more about it, but I didn't. The ironic part is, I am a single mom. My kid isn't my significant other's and I raised him alone for two and a half years before I met my significant other. So yes, I do know how hard it is and I live 1,000 miles from my closest family so I never even had the luxury of being able to have my mom watch my kid. Over the next couple of weeks, we didn't find any more dog poo off of our patio, but we did notice our bags were depleting and our trash can was filling up way more quickly than usual. I had my suspicions and wanted to test it. We had recently bought some small security cameras for inside of our apartment for different reasons and I had my boyfriend set one up outside on the patio. We faced it where I could see our door and trash can but didn't point to the rest of the courtyard or other people's units. We respect privacy around here. Sure enough, the same evening my boyfriend set it up, I see Entitled Kid walk onto our patio, take a bag, walk out of frame, and then come back to throw it in our trash can. Okay, now I'm upset, but also not trying to fight this lady or her kid. So I moved the bags to the inside door handle. It's a glass door, so you can still see them, but we always lock our sliding door. Next morning, I hear someone knocking on the back patio door, and I go to see Entitled Kid standing there, looking annoyed. I didn't open the door, I just spoke loudly enough to ask what did he need. He demanded a bag for his dog's mess. I said, I'm sorry, but these are our bags for our dog, and they weren't free for anyone else to use them. The apartment provides bags at a dispenser near the trash can on the other side of the building. The kid started demanding a bag, saying his mom told him he could use ours, slapping his hands on the glass a few times, trying to scare me. Yes, I'm terrified of a 10 year old and finally screaming at me that he's telling his mother on me. I said, fine, go ahead, I'll tell her the same thing. Sure enough, a few minutes later, Entitled Mom is standing on my patio, also demanding a bag for her dog. I denied her a bag and asked her to please step off of my patio as she was making me feel unsafe and uncomfortable. My significant other wasn't home. She told me I was a bratty kid, I'm 24, and she demanded I let her use my bags as I had already told her she could before. I said no, I told you to get some yourself and do what I do, keep them close by and put your own trash can on your own patio, not use the bags I buy with my own money for my own dog and then fill up my tiny trash can. I pointed out that she could use a plastic shopping bag if she didn't want to buy her own bags or she could use the bags the complex provided on the other side of the building. She kept going off on me and I finally told her if she didn't leave my patio, I'd call the police as she was harassing me. The apartment office was closed on Sundays, and of course, it was on a Sunday. 
She acted like she was going to call my bluff, but then my boyfriend got home and walked up behind me to ask what was going on and she ended up dragging her kid away again, leaving the dog's mess in the grass off of my patio. So when she was gone, I took another time-stamped picture of it, downloaded the footage from the security camera of her kid stealing my bags and throwing them in the trash can, and the footage from them that morning yelling at me and demanding my bags and my denying them, and emailed all of it to the apartment management. I told them that she made me feel unsafe and uncomfortable in my own home, that she and her kid felt entitled to come onto my patio and take my belongings. I also went outside, picked up her dog's mess, looked in the trash can on my patio and pulled out the bags with her dog's mess. They were significantly smaller than my dog's mess as I'm sure any dog owners could tell the difference. I went and opened all the bags and dumped them straight on her patio right outside the door. On Monday, I heard back from the office lady who said she would take care of it. By Friday, there was a moving truck an entitled mom and her entitled kid were moving out. Pretty sure they were evicted. After talking to some of our other, much friendlier neighbors, it turns out we weren't the only ones who had been complaining about her. They had only lived in the complex for like two to three months before they made so many enemies that they were kicked out. Sometimes I think I should feel bad for playing a part in them getting evicted, but honestly, I can't bring myself to feel guilty about it. Not my fault she's a lazy entitled jerk who couldn't even be asked to get a shopping bag to pick up her dog's mess. I never heard from her about the dog's mess I dropped on her patio, but I like to think she stepped in it without looking and knew better than to come complaining to me about it. Sorry, not sorry. Also, I'm sure they were given more than a week to vacate, as those are the tenancy laws here, but she packed up and left like a bat out of heck. Guess she didn't want to stay somewhere she was clearly seen as an enemy. Speaking of dog messes, do you pick up after your dog when you take them on a walk or not? Please let us know. Of course not. It's pretty much free fertilizer to be honest. Karen traps herself in a changing room after getting mad at me. This happened a long time ago, before the craziness started. My mom and I were at a Walmart shopping for stuff, possibly some groceries too. My mom finds a shirt and wants to go try it on, so we head to the changing room. I'm waiting for her to try on the shirt and just looking at my phone while keeping an eye on our card. Mom. Hey, Dragon Crystal, can you get a larger size? This one's a bit tight. So I get up and go find a bigger size for her. After I find it and hand it to my mom, I go back to where I was sitting when I hear, Excuse me. I look up and I see Karen standing in a different changing room holding up a shirt or some kind of clothing. Karen. Here, get me a different size. It's too small for me. Me. Um, sorry, but I don't work here. Karen. Well, you helped the other woman. Why wouldn't you help me? I was dressed in all black, not the Walmart uniform. I helped her because she's my mom, and I don't have to help you if I don't feel like it. Besides, I don't even know where you got that from. Karen. If I got this from over there. Points in a random direction. It's not that hard to find. It's right in the opening, so be nice and go get it for me now. Me. Sorry, but I was told to watch the cart and stay here in case something happens to our stuff. But you can change back and get it yourself. Karen angrily huffs and slams the door shut hard. She might have slammed it too hard, because I noticed the door to my mom's changing room shook a bit. A few minutes later, my mom comes out, wondering what happened and what all the yelling was about. I explain everything to her as we walk away. She puts the shirt back because she couldn't find one that fit her. But as we're leaving, I recall hearing a rattling behind us, so I stopped looked around, and even waited a bit for the rattling to start again. Mom notices I stopped. Is something wrong? Me, still looking around. I thought I heard something rattling. Mom, maybe it was the cartwheel, since a lot of these wheels tend to rattle loudly and get squeaky after a while. Let's hurry, we've been here much longer than we should have, and your dad might get mad. So we just walk away, where I eventually spot an actual employee and let her know about Karen needing help, which she responded with, Thanks, I'll head over and see what she needs. My mom and I head over to the grocery section, grab a few items before heading to the checkout area. While we were waiting in line, we hear over the PA system, Um, can we get maintenance over to the changing rooms? We seem to have a bit of a problem over here. We start laughing over the call. We can only assume what the problem could be since we haven't seen Karen leave the rooms. Cashier rings up our stuff and we head home for the evening, not wanting to hear what happened since Karen might accuse me of not helping her and possibly claim that I trapped her in the changing room. Then again, that rattling I heard when we were leaving the area could have been Karen trying to open the door. But since my mom was in a hurry, we saved ourselves from Karen's full wrath. Neighbor thinks she can get me banned from my workplace. I, 18 female, 
have always lived in the same house in the countryside with the same neighbors. A rich family with two daughters at least eight years older than me. When I was a kid, I think things were going quite okay. But as the years passed, they started to respect us less and less and would often get into fights with my parents because of their attitude and noise. They're basically the worst neighbors you can think of. I don't remember exactly when, but I was about eight years old when they even stopped saying hello to me or even replying when I greeted them. They basically stopped acknowledging my existence and I remember it hurting me a lot. Now, we could have complained about them when they stepped out of line, but we knew they had way more money and power than us and that if they wanted to get us into trouble, they could. It came to a close call once when my father snapped at one of the daughters a few years ago. Let's call her Julie. She's the entitled person in this story. Now, Julie and I have one common passion, horses. And of course, we ended up at the same riding center, which is surprising because I would have expected her to choose a more classy and prestigious stable. I've been going there since I was 11, but haven't seen her much because we didn't go there on the same days. At the beginning of 2020, her horse passed away, so she stopped coming. But in the summer, she came back and asked if there was any horse she could buy. I think she's now a part owner of a lovely mare. In the meantime, I had started working at the stable on the weekends and got to know pretty much all of the regular riders and owners that frequent it. The manager of the center knows me well and he lets me take care of one of his horses as if he were my own. So I've been going to the stables every day after school as well and therefore I see Julie a lot. The funny thing is, she's tried so hard to ignore me for the past 10 years that she doesn't know what I look like anymore and therefore hasn't recognized me at all. She just thinks I'm a simple horse girl and not the person who has been living next to her for 18 years. I haven't said anything to anyone about it because I don't want to cause trouble. What happens next at home has nothing to do with the writing center. While we don't really talk to each other, we at least say hi and the regular have a nice ride and such as everyone does where I live. But I think she put the pieces together a few weeks ago because she began giving me dirty looks at the stables. Again, I don't really know what I did to her except merely existing. But for some reason, she wants to cause my family trouble and began talking crap about me. Now, I like to think I'm pretty well liked among the regulars here and have no problems with anyone. I've heard from a few friends that Julie has been talking about me, so I just admitted that she was indeed my neighbor and that our families didn't get along well, but that I never wanted to bring our personal problems to the writing center. Obviously, she doesn't hold the same views as me. At first, I didn't pay it any attention, but then she started talking to my boss, the stable's owner, about me. He was the one telling me about it, but he didn't go into the details. Apparently, she's been asking things like, is she even qualified? And she's not very polite. She's been causing problems with the horse owners, which is utter BS if you ask me, and basically pressuring him into firing me. Well, that obviously didn't happen because my boss is not someone you can manipulate like that, and he saw right through her crap. He warned her that if he ever heard one more bad word about me, he would ban her from the writing center. I didn't really go over the details in the post on why my neighbors don't like us, but I do know the reason of the animosity. Basically, my neighbors are the kind of people who expect everyone to kneel before them and that they can get away with everything because they have money and powerful work positions. When my parents moved into our house, they played really nice, inviting them for dinner and giving them their old baby and kid stuff because my mother was pregnant at the time. But my parents had understood from the beginning that there was nothing generous and honest about them and their nice acts. It was a way to get you on their side, to buy you, if you will, so they could get away with more crap. So they soon started pushing the limits of what a respectable neighbor would do. Always making noise, always being extremely loud, having gardeners and or construction workers working for them on Sundays, which is illegal in my country because you're not supposed to make noise on Sunday. Organizing barbecues every evening with kerosene, which made an awful thick smoke that invaded our garden and would get inside our house. Because of them, we can never enjoy a single day of peaceful rest. We can never be outside without hearing their loud voices. We can never have a window open without their cigarette smoke getting inside. We can never sleep peacefully because they have to go outside in the middle of the night very loudly, often very drunkenly. I remember my father once asking them to tone it down at midnight on a Sunday while they were having a party outside because I was small and had school in the morning. They didn't tone it down. And the next day, my parents received a letter asking to meet up to discuss. Then when my parents went to talk with them, the neighbors basically said that my father had been in the wrong for that and that they were keeping them from living their life. Things like that kept happening over and over. They even had the audacity to complain when we had family over and my young cousins were playing in the garden rather loudly. The one time that my father snapped at the daughter was because she kept yelling for nothing. 
I swear, they can't speak without screaming. It's the worst thing. She complained to her parents about it. She was at least 23 at the time, and they tried calling my mom at work to say my father was out of line. So yeah, they basically hate my family for existing. They're genuinely the worst people I know. I'm actually so angry after writing this, I want to cry about it. I truly believe they wasted a good part of our lives. My parents bought this house in the calm countryside with a nice garden and lots of place to relax outside, and they never got to enjoy it. The number of times we couldn't sleep because of them. The number of times my mom was stressed out and crying because of them. I'm so angry. I can't wait to move out so my parents can go live somewhere else as well. Have you ever had neighbors that you just couldn't stand? If so, what did they do wrong? Please let us know. My neighbor still won't let me use his Wi-Fi. I'm going to make him regret it. I talked back to a customer today and it felt amazing. So I had this real grumpy, real picky, real old guy come in today. He says what he wants. I pull out the bread and he tells me he wants it cut in two halves. I ask if he wants it cut into two six inches or no, cut the top half from the bottom half completely. He interrupts before I can finish asking my question. So I do. For anyone reading who hasn't worked at Subway, our bread knives are by design too short to cut the bread completely in half. We're supposed to cut through most of the bread, called a wedge cut, so I have to cut the entire way around the bread. As soon as I do, he yells, like actually raised his voice, Stop! You're tearing up the bread! So I separate the bread as best I can and very carefully cut what I need to with only the very tip of my knife. So his bread is finally cut to his liking. I ask if he wants it toasted and he says yes. So I start putting on his ham. No, no, no! He again raises his voice to tell me that he only wants the bread toasted. So I toast just his two separate halves of bread like he wants. Then he stops his yelling for a while but still managed to criticize everything. His cheese was too overlapping slightly. I was spilling too much lettuce. The tomatoes I chose weren't good enough for him. His onions weren't spread out enough. He wanted me to lift up the meat to place the sauces right on the bread. Then I finally close his sub. Kinda awkward when it's in two separate pieces by the way. Maybe we do the wedge cut for a reason. Cut the sandwich in half the proper way this time and go to wrap it when he raises his voice again yelling. Look what you've done. You've cut the paper along with my sandwich. So I found out being yelled at four times was my limit and I snapped. I told him something like, I've been trying to do my best with your difficult requests this whole time. Man, and it does not matter at all if your deli paper is cut because your sandwich gets wrapped in something else anyway. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are other people behind you waiting for food, so I have to work fast and you've just been difficult and rude the whole time. I then quickly bagged his sandwich, pushed it towards him and started ringing him up while he just stood there for a few seconds and just started to make me feel bad about it until he just turns around and leaves yelling on his way that he will never be back to our subway. I hope he was telling the truth. Speaking of subway, what's your favorite sandwich at subway? Please let us know. Sweet onion chicken teriyaki for the win bruh. This idiot bought a bag of two year old popcorn. This just happened today. I work in a candy store with a popcorn section. The store opened at 9 a.m. I wasn't scheduled until 11 a.m. It took me until 3.30 p.m. to even realize this. I was ringing down a lady and she asked about our popcorn sizes. It went as followed. We've got the lady and me. Me. Hello ma'am, what can I do for you today? Lady. I want some cheddar cheese popcorn. Me. Okay, no problem. What size? What are your sizes? I point to the shelf above me with our displayed sized popcorn bags. Me. Well, we have the large bag only for butter for $3, we have the large flavored for $6.95, and we have, uh, I'm sorry ma'am, I'm a little caught off guard. We did have a display bag for our regular size. She laughs at my confusion and we finish the transaction. Two minutes later, my boss walks by and I call him. Me. Hey, um, tell me. I point to the display shelf. Did someone really come in and steal our display bag? I can't hold my laughter. I've never seen him look so confused as he sees the bag missing and he just keeps saying, That is nasty. Me. That bag is two years old. I'm practically on the floor laughing at this point and I tell everybody. Not long after, I tell my coworker who works in the front and has been here since opening. Coworker. Oh my god, that is disgust. Wait, was it cheddar cheese popcorn in that bag? Me. Yeah. Coworker. Oh my god, I sold it to him. So here's what apparently happened. Some guy came into our popcorn section and instead of asking for help, he decided to grab our display bag that I guess he assumed was fresh 
even though it was cold and has the price written on it in faded sharpie. Then he went to my coworker and handed her the bag facing the other way so she didn't see the writing and paid $4 for it. I've been laughing since this happened and I'm waiting for this guy to call our store and complain about his stale, expired, cheddar, two-year-old popcorn. DoorDash sucks. This happened a couple of days ago, but I'm finally feeling cranky enough to vent about it. My job is open for sit down and we do take out for pickup only. You call us, I take your order, I ring it in, you come pay me and I hand you your food. We were not on any kind of dash, any type of eating that could be Uber, nothing. We found out that someone, or the app itself, put our restaurant on the app by themselves with food we didn't have available and incorrect prices. So someone calls in an order. I enter it, and to everyone's surprise, a dasher shows up. They pay me with their card, DoorDash card, and of course leave no tip. It dawns on me that the dashers are getting orders sent to them somehow and then calling it in themselves. I have no idea what the heck this loophole was, but I was sick of being stiffed on $100 plus orders, especially after the owner of the pub said we aren't on DoorDash. So a few days ago, this happens again. I tell him we aren't on DoorDash and I have no idea how he got this order, but don't do it again. He asks how long the food will be, so I tell him five to 10 minutes still. He gets super mad and says, cancel it, cancel the order, and storms out. So I tell Kitchen not to make it, I avoid the order, go on with my life. 25 minutes later, a new dasher shows up. I'm confused as I have no orders. He shows me the canceled order. I tell him, no, you guys canceled it. The customer? No, the very angry jerk who left here almost 30 minutes ago. I tell him we don't have the order anymore. The food isn't and won't be ready and they leave. I open DoorDash and see our restaurant on there even though we shouldn't be. I show the owner of the place and in two minutes we are removed from the site as we should have been the entire time. Literally the most annoying thing I've dealt with and 75% of my customers are creepy old dudes. Ugh. Edit. I do not have any hate for dashers. I've never been rude to a delivery driver and I have no clue how the app slash company works. Sorry. I know we all get paid like crap and rely on our tips to get by. I simply wanted to vent about an experience I had. If I was a jerk to everyone for no reason, I wouldn't be in customer service. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.